Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the Sacramento City Council will please come to order. Would the clerk please call the roll to establish a quorum? Councilmember Ashby. Councilmember. Councilmember Harris. Here. Councilmember Hansen. Here. Councilmember Carr. Here. Councilmember Jennings. Here. Councilmember Schneer. Here. Mayor Steinberg. Here. Councilmember Guerra will be absent, but I expect Councilmember Warren momentarily. Very good. Good evening to everyone. Let us begin uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance. If we could rise, if Councilmember Rick Jennings could please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, there's no closed session report, Madam City Attorney. That's correct, Mayor. Very good, we do have one special presentation tonight recognizing Habitat for Humanity and their leadership in South Oak Park and throughout the city. I wanna turn it over to Council Member Chenier. Thank you, Mayor. Actually, there's three groups that got together to work and improve a neighborhood and support uh, what's happening in South Oak Park. So it's Habitat for Humanity, Leadership Sacramento and the South Oak Park Community Association. Um, they got together and did an event called Rock the Boat, not Rock the Boat, I'm sorry. <laughs> Rock the Boat. <laughs> Election in Mississippi tonight. So, um, but um, they, they did Rock the Block and they came together and did two things. One was they worked on a number of houses in the, in the neighborhood that needed a little bit of uplifting themselves. Um, and I think they also had a good time in creating community. Uh, one thing I, I will never forget is now, it's, it's kind of emblazoned in my mind, is at the end of the day, they had a band there and the mayor got up and sang uh, a song with them. Um, a which, Horse With No Name by America, actually. Which he did, for and the we're record. very happy he's our mayor, and that's how we'd like to keep it, um, <laughs> and not leading a band. <laughs> so it was Thank good. you, yes. But what I'd like to do is bring up uh, representatives of those three organizations. I know we have a number of people from the South Oak Park neighbor, uh, Community Association here and Habitat. Are we here? Come on up. And also Leadership Sacramento. I think a round of applause would be great. And maybe what we could do uh, is if we could get one person from each organization just to talk for a minute, Leah, if you want to start about why, why this was important to you and what you accomplished here. Yeah. Forward and, and uh, celebrate our collaborative efforts through Rock the Block. When we came together as a group, um, over 200 volunteers over two days helped to revitalize the neighborhood by um, doing some uh, lifting of, of 17 different homes, some home repairs, and two community projects. And it's important for us as Habitat for Humanity because, as many people know, we build homes, but we also repair homes and communities. And so it was a great opportunity and collaborative effort to bring all of these people together and develop a relationship in the South Oak Park neighborhood because we intend to be in that neighborhood for years to come to help through year after year continue to lift that neighborhood and create more community. Great. Michael, do you want to talk from the Neighborhood Association? Right, so from the Neighborhood Association's perspective, um, we maybe work... Maybe introduce yourself, sorry. Sorry? Introduce yourself. Oh, hello. I'm Michael Blair, everybody, and uh, president of the South Oak Park Community Association. And, you know, from our perspective, we try to look at uplifting that neighborhood every day. Um, South Oak Park gets a lot of recognition sometimes, and sometimes it's not for the right reasons. So we try to do anything we can to... Um, make it a more desirable place to live. So still a lot of work to do, but with thanks from folks like Habitat, um, from Leadership Sacramento, and then all the work that Jay's done in the community. Uh, it's, it's, it's improving, we still have a ways to go, uh, but we're, we're, we're getting there. And Mr. Mayor, I wanna thank you for coming out uh, and, and, and doing your thing. I actually have it on video. I wish we could have <laughs> queued it up today. That would've been really cool. Well, so. uh, please don't. Uh. <laughs> It's all on Facebook, so. Actually we'll a great, it. it was actually a great moment. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And leadership? 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Lindsay Goodwin, and I am a proud member of the Leadership of Sacramento Class of 2018. Myself and 37 classmates had a unique opportunity to take part in this program, which you know is designed to uh, cultivate and develop civically-minded business and community leaders. And as uh, over the course of the year-long program, we have an opportunity to learn about issues impacting our region, and we also have an opportunity to come together as a class to identify a need in our community and do a, and complete a community class project. So when we we talked about the issues facing our region, the housing supply and affordability, affordability issue really rose to the top as an issue impacting Sacramento as well as communities across uh, this state. So when we talked about addressing that need in our community, we thought who better to partner with than Habitat for Humanity. So we were so um, grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community and work with Habitat for Humanity. So, and I just want to say this is such a great example of, you know, different organizations with folks from different parts of the city coming together over a common purpose, a common goal, doing some work, and coming out with a real positive project. So I, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, really, on behalf of all of us, you, you are a great example of what's wonderful about Sacramento. Um, this is when people step up to do the right thing. You all have stepped up to do the right thing and did it together. So thanks very much. Um, let's give them a round of applause, please. And if, if you all want to come up here, we'll do a picture with the resolutions, and I'm going to ask the mayor to come down as well, since course, he, he was the one who led the song. Deep, deep appreciation, really incredible. You get everyone? All right, ready? Okay. Um, all right. We now move to the consent calendar, where, as I understand, Councilmember Harris and Han Vice Mayor Hans want to pull item one off. If that's all right, we're going to set that aside for several minutes um, and take up the rest of the consent calendar, which is items, what, two through? Uh, one through 13, with the exception of one. That's what I meant. Two through, so two through 13, I know Councilmember Jennings has a comment on item 11. Renewing your so why don't you go ahead, take the floor here, then we'll take the public testimony, and then we'll vote on the consent calendar, items 2 through 13. Thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, item 11 is the renaming of a park in District 7 that is currently named the Mesa Grande Park. And uh, this item is the opportunity to rename the park for a young man who was a tremendous asset to his neighborhood community called the Mesa Grande Neighborhood Association, but also to the entire city of Sacramento. Um, this young man was born in New Orleans in 1942. And 45 years later, he moved to the city of Sacramento where he bought his home in the Mesa Grande neighborhood area. Um, 
He became a leader. He became a mentor. He was a father. He was a husband. He was the guy that everybody looked up to and still do to this day. I personally will say that he has been a mentor to me and has helped me to be a better man um, and a better council member. So with that, I just want to bring his wife up to the, to the podium um, just to acknowledge her and his daughter as well. I think she's here with him. The whole family. Bring the family up. Come on, bring the family up. We, we, the whole family. The biological family and the neighborhood family. Bring them all up. Come on. <laughs> come on up, please. Um, while they come up, whether it be volunteers in police services, and I can't even tell you how many hours he volunteered for that, the uh, Deerfield Mesa Grande Neighborhood Association, where he was president for many years, uh, National Nights Out, where they put the best, the, one of the best National Nights Out in the entire District 7, the annual Easter egg hunt, movie nights, or the adopted park program. And I know I've left a whole lot out, and I'd, I'd love to give the family an opportunity to speak as well on this. But Willie Castone was a great man, and it is my honor to lead the charge to rename the park and to make this a memory that will last forever and for families and kids to see forever the impact that one man can make in a neighborhood and that we want them to make sure that they know who that one man is. And so I'd like to give the family a couple minutes to have some words um, on what this means to them, the renaming of this park. Of course. Do you want to say anything? Okay. Uh, to the group, I'd like to express my humble thanks for all that you're doing in the city. And Willie loved working and doing whatever he could for the city. He, he just seemed like he couldn't do enough. And uh, he just grew to love being in our neighborhood watch group or whatever he was asked to do. He loved doing it for the city because he knew it would make a difference. And that's what we are striving for, to make a difference in the city. If you can't tell already, this is his proud wife, Charlene. Please give her a round of applause. And I'd just like to take a few minutes, too. My name is Richard Falcon, part of District 7 with the Deerfield Mesa Grande Neighborhood Association. And on behalf of the neighborhood there in Valley High and the family here, we want to thank you for the opportunity to bring this before you for approval. Uh, one thing we're going to say is make sure, because in the, in, in the agenda it says William Castone. He is Willie, Willie Castone. So let's make sure when that's... Willie Caston. Yeah, Willie you keep saying Caston, you got me going there, Mr. Jett. <laughs> Caston, Willie Caston. But Willie was a leader. He was a friend. He was a great church man. And he just was an inspiration to me personally, and I know all of our neighborhood. And this was just our way of showing that one man can make a difference in what he does, and one man can achieve so much. And he was just a humble man, as the family is humble. And we thank you because children in the future in our neighborhood will be able to look at that sign and say, who is Willie Caston? And we're going to be able to tell him and carry on that legacy within there that a common man can have such an honor and make such a difference. So thank you. Thank you. Great honor. Thank you, Councilmember Jennings. And thank you to the family and yeah, but it's really wonderful when we can honor and remember somebody, right? And a renaming is a renaming is forever. Forever. And um, this is one that is uh, one that the neighborhood will remember forever because of the impact that he's made to that community. And and I don't know that I've done it justice. I just know that the impact that he's made in my life, and I know the countless other ones that he's made as well. And so. I'm really, really happy to have this opportunity for this naming, and I'm glad that the family came down for it. That is fabulous. Okay, so we're going to vote on. You know, it's not done yet. We have to vote. We have to vote on this now in a, in a few minutes. But it, just take a. It's going to take another minute. Make sure. It's going to take another couple minutes. So take take a seat because we have uh, some public testimony on. Uh, the rest of the consent calendar, we have Councilmember Warren who would make a comment on a different item. Item 12, sir. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, item 12 is uh, the extension of the Railroad Avenue uh, winter triage, and, and I want to commend, you know, I think uh, the mayor and Councilman Harris has done a fantastic job with what they have uh, attempted to do with uh, limited resources, and, and particularly, though, uh, as it relates to the extension with the mayor, um, uh, with uh, private resources in addition to this, now the request is for additional public resources. But, but what I do want to do is to make sure that the people of District 2 are recognized because this facility is essentially encompassed uh, in and has direct impacts to District 2. And I got a number of messages from people saying they would have liked to have known and been able to come and comment on it. I will say there's no fire and fury. Uh, it is, though, uh, recognized that there has been some impacts. There was some resources for mitigation, and uh, we appreciate that as well. But I think as it relates to this particular issue, there's still some sensitivity, and folks don't want to feel left out of the discussion as we continue to broaden our uh, attempt to deal with homelessness throughout the entire city of Sacramento and not just in parts of District 2, which I know we are working on diligently as a council. So, so Councilman, let me just, I, I just want to respond. First of all, to thank you for your leadership throughout this, and Councilmember Harris, of course, as well, who sort of found the site. Um, and yeah, it's in District 3, but it has, you're right, uh, it, it has affected District 2, and, and you know, uh, and you've stepped up as has council member Harris in a big way, and so have your residents. And I know that this was controversial at first, but as you say, there's no fire and fury. It turned out to be less controversial uh, over time. And the only thing that I want to say without breaking any news here, because I'm not ready to, is stay tuned. Just stay tuned, okay? You will wonder, are we going to take this very successful proof of concept, triage shelter for a low barrier triage shelter and expand it, the answer is yes. Stay tuned. Thanks. All right, let's hear the public testimony. I have three speakers on item number 12. The first is Robert Copeland, David Adderhold, and then David Andre. Well, I'd like to see this extended indefinitely, and I may be expanded to other districts like uh, mine, which is District 4, uh, 1, 5, 6, 7, 8, have, uh, triage shelters in every district. Because we got, we got homeless population all over Sacramento County. Even we had on, even in the county part of Madison uh, Avenue, it's got uh, homeless people. I think I should, you should work with the county and the other cities in this area to, uh, to lessen the in, uh, amount of people that are out on the streets on cold winter nights or on, uh, when the smoke became really bad when we had a forest fire up north by Paradise. I think uh, we should have uh, more triage shelters. Uh, is it, am I correct? It, it's extended to the uh, end of the year? Yes, that's the action. I see it extended past the end of the year, if possible, or get a replacement if you can't find one. Thank you. Hear you. Next speaker is Dan Adderholt and then David Andre. Hello again, Mayor, Hello, Jeff Harris. Hello again. As you guys know, like I said earlier, when you guys saw me earlier today, the people here don't know, I'm a leader of American River Homeless Crew. We're the ones that clean the city of the American River um, when Park Recreation had no money to do so. But I'm here for the railroad shelter, supporting the guys do extension, please, because I know you guys are trying to open up other shelters and do expansions and stuff. But right now, we're going to have the coolest winter ever. And it's time to speak actions and do more action than more talking. And I know Jeff Harris, you're a man of action. I know this for a fact. I don't know you very well, Mayor. I'm not trying to dad you or nothing. But I know Jeff Harris, a man, man of, of action, action he speaks too. his words. Yes. And I've worked, me and my homeless crew do seven days a week, cleaning seven days a week for the last two years. We've been cleaning the American River and keeping it clean down there. 
And all we're asking is if you guys just help us and join forces with us to keep, and keep shelters open where people homes have a place to go and won't be dying on the streets. Because my, um, also I can help you guys too. I got a Christian group, if people are veterans or homeless or on SSI that don't drink or do drugs, I can get them off the streets right now today. I got plenty of homes open right now. So if you guys want a card where you guys can contact, I can give you guys cards. I'll be helping you guys get the homes off the streets as well. I'm just asking you guys, please to keep the railroad shelter open. That's my main focus right now being here today is keep the home shelter open. Please, Mayor. I know you're going to do something else, open more expansions, but please extend the expansion, please. The past December 31st, New Year's Eve being thrown out in the streets. That's just pure evilness. I don't know you guys. I know you guys are not evil. I know you guys are not bad people. But I just wish you guys would just do the right thing and open and keep the shelters open longer. And Jeff Harris, I'd love to talk to you. You're my, you're, you, know, you know who I am. I'd love to talk to you and talk more about what we're doing with our community because I've heard these guys talk about the, how they, the people are doing their community. I think that's awesome, clean up their community. But my home's crews are going around, not just the American River, we're cleaning all over Sacramento. We're cleaning around schools and that's our main priority is protecting the children. And that's what I want to talk to you about, Jeff Harris. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is David Andre on item 12. Hi, good evening, members of the city council. Uh, this is great, extending the shelter. Um, there's a perception on the street that too much money is being paid into these different things that we're buying for the shelter. Um, a lot of us do the same stuff on way less money. We need to have some type of a fiscal responsibility audit where we don't just look that we spent this much money on chairs. We look, was that a good deal? Was that a good purchase in the economy? We need to have that perception going forward because we don't even have warming stations. There's no place for people to dry their clothes. Once somebody's sleeping bag gets wet, now that the police aren't taking them, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, their stuff's still wet, there's no place to really dry them. When we had the warming centers, we had that. So at the same time, they were going forward with the shelter, thank you very much. Let's talk about maybe some warming shelters or s something else so people can get their clothes and their stuff like dried. Thank you very much. So David, I, I just wanna respond. I know this is part of the agenda, so it's proper to have at least a, a slight dialogue. Your uh, point about a cost effectiveness, I think is absolutely correct. Jeff Harris, if I might, was uh, talking, we were talking this morning about, um, about breaking down the costs here, and we will do that in a more formal way. But I can tell you sort of approximately and tentatively, we've, you know, there have been um, over 600 people who have come through the railroad uh, triage shelter. Um, many of them have been housed either transitionally or permanently, and of course some remain in the shelter. So we're, we're in the hundreds in terms of people being housed. And we've taken the, the cost of the, uh, the concept over the course of the last year since we started, what, about January 1st. And we estimate, and we will refine this, but I just want to be responsive here, that it's about $25,000 a year to actually house people on a longer term basis. $25,000 a year to get a human being on a path towards uh, permanent supportive housing or whatever form of support that they need. And given the amount of money that law enforcement, as you come up here every week and, and talk about this, and the rest of our city, public works and everything, is spending upon the impacts of homelessness. Once we put those numbers out in a more formal way, um, this is a great investment. And frankly, the low barrier triage is the only way to get people who have been homeless for a long period of time and who are, quote, resistant for whatever life trauma reasons they um, that are dealing with actually into shelter pets, possessions, and place. And so um, we defend this model and that's why we want to expand it because we think it holds the best hope of actually getting the people who have been on the streets for the longest in the most intractable way towards a better life and a better path. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if we could get that cost per person down below 25000 we could help some more, is my hope. Well, you know, we, we perform a lot of miracles here, but, you know. Thank you. Please. Jeff Harris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for framing the discussion that way. I know that some people feel that the cost of running the shelter is uh, high, 
But when you look at what the impacts of homelessness cost us year over year, the back end savings of, of running triage and getting people off the street more than pays for the cost of the shelter. Uh, we, we're, we're gathering a lot of data to be able to make this case. Every service resistant quote unquote person that we get into housing solves a big problem for us in the long term in, uh, in terms of impacts to the city generally and to our general fund. This is a great program and um, we, you know, we feel that we really need to progress with it and serve more people. As far as the cost per person, well look, everybody has unique issues. Some people require a tremendous amount of service. Some people have a very deep plethora of issues to work through and it's costly, it's just costly. But once again, I want to reiterate, we get back in savings that, that well pay for what we invest in moving these people into a better condition in life. Okay, let's continue please with the public testimony. Thank you. That's it, okay, we have the consent calendar now that we're covering items two through 13th. Is there a, a motion uh, and a second? All in favor, uh, including the key vote on item 12 here. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Shall be done. Thank you. That's the consent calendar. Congratulations. Okay, now let's uh, take item one, which was pulled from the consent calendar. How do we want to commence this? We want to begin with Councilmember Harris or, or the staff presentation? Staff presentation here, okay. Who is presenting on this item? Good evening, Mayor Steinberg, Vice Mayor, and members of the City Council. My name is Ophelia Avalos, and I'm the project manager for the C3 project, representing the Office of the City Manager. Um, before you tonight is an item with um, staff recommending a motion to remove trees. Um, we have heard concerns, and we have um, gone back and um, done some more work and are continually working on this. And um, we just want to clarify tonight that the 96 trees are actually 51 viable trees. So um, we're going to go, I have here um, Kevin Hawker from Urban Forestry, and we're going to go over um, this information with everyone here. Okay. All right. I'll take it from there. So the new city, um, Tree Protection Ordinance requires that the City Council approve all tree removals on city projects of, of this nature. So we need to disclose all the trees that are being removed. So the report says that there are 91 or 96 trees uh, with a total trunk diameter of um, 1,171 inches. But a lot of those trees are not trees that you would think of in the traditional sense. Some of those are very small, um, uh, pine trees that are functioning as bushes. Some of those are large camellia trees that are also functioning as bushes and, and ornamental, um, you know, shrubbery. Um, so when we remove those out of, out of it, we, we really have are about 51 healthy trees that we're removing with approximately, well, um, a total aggregate um, trunk diameter of 679 inches. The replacement plan that is proposed for this project proposes to replace uh, the 51 trees with 80 trees, and the 80 trees will have a total um, trunk diameter of 216 inches. And we can move on to show you exactly uh, what that might look like. Okay, so we have, we're adding 29 trees, uh, but we're not quite meeting uh, the, the trunk diameter item there. 
So let's move. So what this looks like is, is you, what you're looking at are the yellow uh, dots there are the trees that are basic that have been identified in the report as as trees, uh, but they are you know functioning as as bushes and, and shrubs. Um, there are the red dots that you're seeing are certain uh, trees that have um, a public safety interest to them. They either are, have structural defects, they're not viable in their location, um, they're you know, damaging foundation of the building, things like that. Um, and then the, the blue dots are the ones that we're really talking about that are just healthy trees that uh, need to be removed in order to facilitate the, the, the project goals. This is another shot of the, um, the convention center, and we have the similar, uh, similar situation. We have a, uh, only about two uh, trees in this one that are considered shrubs, about three trees that are unsustainable, um, and the rest of them are, are healthy trees in this, in this situation. So in summary, we reported that there were 96 trees, which included uh, shrubs, it included trees that are less than four inches in diameter, it included healthy trees, it, it, was the, it was the whole package. Out of that, what we're really talking about are 51 healthy trees being proposed for removal. We're proposing to replace those with 80 new trees. Should mention, um, kind of got on a roll and forgot to mention, the City Council has the discretion to decide what the appropriate replacement plan is for each individual project. City Council historically has uh, decided uh, these on a case-by-case -case basis based on what the, the interest of the, each project is. When Urban Forestry makes a recommendation to the Council on what, what Urban Forestry feels is, is the most appropriate in the case, we feel that there's an expectation that the City should meet the same requirements as a private developer would. This is never going to be an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because it's just not ever going to be the same. But as close as possible, we would like to, to match that. If this were a private development, and a private developer would be removing what would be called private protected trees. Now, these are not private protected trees, but the only trees on this list that would be analogous to private protected trees, there are five of them. And they have a total trunk diameter of 141 inches. So if we go back to our plan, we're putting in 80 new trees with a total trunk diameter of 216 inches, we're exceeding that, uh, that guideline and standard that is put in the code for um, private developers. And in this case, um, we just wanted to make sure that you understood everything that is, is before you so that you can make an appropriate decision. Okay. Well, thank you. Are we... Yeah, so um, I just wanted to show real quick some of the renderings that um, we are putting in there. This is an expansion, and, you, and as you see, the roof here expands over within the existing right-of-way, and so there is, um, th that is the cause of uh, the removing the trees along 13th Street here. Um, we are proposing to replace 80 trees, as Kevin mentioned. This is a, a top view of the proposed courtyard, and... Um, this is a 3D uh, rendering of the same view, and you, we are, as you can see, we are proposing um, quite a bit of trees to go back. And this is the same courtyard, just on a st uh, street level view. Um, so, and I want to talk about the schedule a little bit. Um, I know there was concern about if, if tonight this is recommended to proceed forward, you know, with the lag time between removing trees and the project construction. I do want to um, let folks know that we are um, starting construction with the convention center. We have issued the notice to proceed for that. The, the community theater uh, project is, is uh, expected to start in February. So if, if they are recommended, we proceed and they're recommended to get removed, they would be removed. Um, pretty soon between prior to January 30th. And so um, there is no, it's important to note that there is no lag time between the start of construction and the actual time that we're removing the trees. So we're not gonna be removing them two years in advance. You know, we're gonna be removing them right at the time. And both both projects are, are um, as you can see, are, are happening around the same time and they're both, um, well, they're both starting this winter and they're uh, scheduled to end in April of 2021, so um, they will be planted prior to the spring of 2021, all the 80 trees. 
So if um, you guys have any other <coughs> questions. So I, I think what we want to do here is let's hear from the public unless the members want to present an alternative to the staff recommendation first. That might be a better way to do this, actually, because it might affect or at least uh, the, the public should be able to hear what some of the mem lead members have been thinking on this issue and, uh, and respond to that because it might be, um, might think differently of it, okay? So let's, let's begin then with, um, Council with Vice Mayor uh, Hansen. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor, um, and I apologize in advance. I'm, um, it may be the flu, I don't think it is, but bear with me while I work through this a little bit. Uh, first, I want to thank Trees for Sacramento to bring, for bringing this to our attention because the agenda obviously came out over the holiday, and um, when I saw it, I was surprised at the numbers, and so when we got back in the office yesterday, we started digging into this, and I also want to thank Jeff Harris for his work because he is one of our tree experts on the council, if not the tree expert, and working through this, a couple of things became clear, and I want to thank our staff for presenting it um, <clears throat> some things were counted and we have a, a very long list of each individual specimen but a lot of the detail that trees for Sacramento wanted wasn't in the staff report the analysis the conversation and as we looked at it sort of the conclusions were there but nothing to explain why or how these decisions were made and so I think that's something that we learn for next time is really trying to lay out more information um, some of these trees on this list, there's a two inch crepe myrtle um, that's representative of a, of a small tree. Some of these are bushes, I, I know the site well. And we were counting them, I believe, in an effort to be fully transparent, but may have, been, may have caused alarm in the process about exactly what was going on. Now, I say that um, knowing that 51 trees is a very significant loss for the city and for the community. Um, some of these are against the buildings, um, and, and we've heard about that. Some of them are in the footprint of the new building. And some of them, um, for whatever reason, the species type were just never, um, particularly the palms come to mind, they never really provided much of a shade benefit. They're more ornamental. So I think as we work through this, it's, it's good to know what um, Kevin and Ophelia presented, that there were really, uh, if we held ourselves to the same standard of a private development, there are really five trees here that qualify as private prote protected trees. And I think those have 108 inches of um, diameter. I'm sorry? 141, my notes here are not as good as your slides, apparently. Um, <clears throat> of, those 100, uh, of those 51, five are palm trees. Um, but I think the real thing here is that this is a very unique project. This is the civic project that will define probably the next 40 plus years of Sacramento, whether it's at the theater or at the convention center. And I think we want to go beyond what is required of a private developer. I think here we want to go and we want to hit the mark of what a visitor would go wow at. We want to demonstrate our values and our values really as a city involve our trees. Our trees are very important. They provide shade in the hot summers, but we also know we have these climate change um, events that continue to happen, and trees are one of the primary mitigants against CO2 release, and um, honestly, just to provide some shade for, for folks. So one of the things that, um, Mr. Harrison, I really want to thank you for, for digging in on this, if you excuse the expression. Um, I think we need to ensure that if we're going to remove these, these specimens that we replace as many as we can, and clearly um, we're talking about replacing a significant number, but the inches lost that we could, on a $300 million project, invest some money back in, I think we should fund um, the inch for inch mitigation that we require a private developer to, but on our height, heightened standard here for this particular project, and I'd like to see all the 463 inches not replaced replaced and mitigated. And that could be by reforesting uh, other areas that have lost trees. Memorial Auditorium comes to mind because we've lost some very significant elms at Memorial that we really need to replace. And that is an opportunity where there's open space and land to do that. Um, but, but in the end, even if we can mitigate and replace those trees, put money into a fund, it doesn't compensate for the lack of some canopy. And I think 
how we continue to work to educate the public about planting, working with Trees for Sacramento, and those people who are concerned, I think is a really viable path to continuing to create a better, greener city with more trees. And so, um, Mr. Harris, if you don't mind, I, I, I'd make a motion that we um, uh, adapt the staff, staff recommendation to provide for that, I believe it's 150,000 plus in mitigation, $150,475. Um, but also that we really connect with some of the people who flag this issue. They're passionate, they're smart, they know why this matters and they represent a big section of the community to figure out how to do this well. Um, I don't think that we're in a place where we're gonna stop these very large projects and I don't know that they have the impression that we would stop these projects, but maybe there's some that we've marked for removal that after collaborating through, we could keep. But if we have to remove some of them that are healthy, let's find a place in collaboration with the community that we can plant and that we can ensure the next generation benefits from that canopy, like the generation before us who planted them gave it to us, so. One of clarification, could you repeat your motion? Uh, Mr. Carr, the motion is basically to um, to modify the staff recommendation uh, to acknowledge that we are removing um, 51 uh, trees and that of them there's 80 being planted, is that correct? And that the number of inches non-mitigated by those 80 trees is uh, 463 inches. Uh, there is a requirement that for every inch, $325 is set aside and that works out to $150,475, which on a $300 million project is, is uh, very much a worthy investment. Okay, Councilman Harris. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I appreciate uh, that we came to the same conclusion. What I'd like to do is make people aware of our tree replanting fund that is built into the tree ordinance that we crafted and finalized in 2016, and many of the people who worked on that tree ordinance are sitting in the audience. In the end, we put in this mitigation fund because we know that projects will come up that require the removal of trees, but what we're looking for, if we remove a healthy specimen, uh, is to get some kind of mitigation going such that we can replace our tree canopy and in fact enhance it. I want to give you some examples of what our tree replanting mitigation fund has achieved in a short period of time. But before that I do that, there, there are a couple of comments. You know, if you think of trees as a city asset and then you think of the community center theater or the convention center as a different type of asset, Sometimes the city has the discretion to remove one to get better value from another. I think people have suggested that this is a swapping of assets, but I see it differently because we know that tree canopy coverage is essential to our life here in Sacramento, and we, we simply can't live without it. If we're gonna lose trees, it was always our intention with the tree ordinance and certainly with the urban forestry master plan project to set a course by which we could enhance our tree canopy over time. The Urban Forestry Master Plan project should be coming to a close very soon and be released, in which we will state canopy coverage goals for the city. When I went back over our tree ordinance, I realized in, in 12.56.040, it's rather vague about uh, removal of city trees as regards public projects. So today at Lawn Ledge, I asked it to be put on the log that we revisit the tree ordinance in this regard after our urban forestry master plan is adopted so that using those goals, we can be guided to tighten up the tree ordinance insofar as city projects go. I think that for this particular project, it is absolutely appropriate to put into the mitigation fund this $150,000 because that will lead to a lot of trees. Um, all that being said, I'd like to ask Mr. Hawker a couple of questions. The first money that was put into the mitigation fund was really from a set of five trees in South Natomas and a median mitigation. It ended up being, I believe, in the $80,000 range. 
And working with our urban forester, I allocated that to the South Natomas Urban Greening Program. So we lost five trees in that median, and Kevin, perhaps you can tell what that burgeoned into to give people an idea of how robust this mitigation fund can actually be in terms of replacing our canopy over time. So in general, that, that money was coupled with other monies uh, to make a larger project. And so those five trees turned into 750 trees in that area. So we, uh, what we can do is not only plant the trees with the money we have, we can leverage it for even larger projects to, to do things that can result in five trees turning into 750 trees. So we leveraged it by working with the Tree Foundation. You know, that's how we got to that, that level. And we are, in fact, going to plant 750 trees in South Natomas area as a result of having this mitigation fund. And that was the result of our work together on the, on the tree ordinance. You know, we, we can't replace the canopy per se, you know, the first day by planting young trees. But in time, we will definitely increase our canopy. At the same time, we get a new asset. You know, these three the two theaters and the, and the Memorial Auditorium rebuild, which are very significant upgrades to the city generally. So my belief is that we can do both. We can lose trees, we can plant a heck of a lot more trees than we lose, and we can build assets that benefit the community at large. The only thing I would add to your motion, perhaps, uh, Vice Mayor, is that this particular mitigation uh, tranche of money, the $150,000, that it be allocated to actual tree planting not to maintenance or other aspects that the, that the replanting fund can be used for. But let's say, okay, that $150,000 will be used to actually put trees in the ground. Uh, absolutely, and uh, I thank you for saying that because that it was intended to be part of my motion. And Mr. Hawker, if you can replace uh, one tree and create 150, we hope that these 51 <coughs> trees turn into 7,650 trees. <laughs> well, we'll talk to the Tree Foundation about that. <laughs> Before I turn it over for public testimony, Councilman Rashford is going to wait until after the public testimony. I just, I just want to under clarify and understand because I think what the members. Uh, did you understand the, the addition to the motion? And the second accepts it? Yep. All right, did you have a. Yeah, may I make a, may I make a comment on that? So, so far and traditionally, the, the tree planting and replacement fund has been used for primarily for planting trees and creating new spaces for trees. Uh, the word maintenance is very general, and I, I just want to assure you we don't use that money for pruning trees. We don't use it for inspecting trees or staff salaries or paying the phone bill. Um, so I would like, if, if it's possible, uh, the flexibility to use the money to create new places to plant trees so that I can, I can plant more trees. Um, I, well, I would say that that's implied in the motion myself because without a place to plant trees, you're not gonna get them in the ground. Okay. And understanding that we also have to keep those trees alive for three years so that they get well established. Absolutely, and, and so I think in, in that sense, if we're clear, we're, we're in agreement on that, that this money is not gonna be used for uh, maintenance in the, in the traditional sense of you know, pruning or just inspecting it or staff salaries, as, as I said. Thank you for the clarification. So, as, as I understand, I just wanna summarize for myself, maybe as much for myself as, we're the public, the, the members, I think, have come up with a very interesting and positive idea here because under the, the city standard that we applied to developers, there would only be an obligation to um, replace 141 <coughs> diameter inches of trees for the trees that are being taken down. Instead, the staff recommendation went above that to 216. What the members are proposing as a motion that I'm prepared to support after I hear the public testimony is that you would, we would fund with $150,000 an additional 463 di diameter inches uh, of tree canopy here and that the total number of trees, 51 lost as you said, but the total number of trees representing that 
that, that the full diameter, the 679 inches diameter, would be well above the 51 trees lost, correct? That's essentially correct. Okay, and, and we, would, we, we would contribute $150,000. I guess the only point I want to make here, I think this is appropriate because this is a major, in fact, the largest uh, public investment uh, that the city is making, and we've spent a lot of time, um, and it's a 300 plus million dollar uh, investment here for the city. And so to make sure that we are doing right and going above and beyond the standard uh, on when it comes to our canopy and the trees is absolutely the right thing to do. It's not a precedent, right, for other smaller projects or, or, or we do have a standard that is in place for private developers. And so um, is this an ex would this be an exception? I suppose it would be, and we can always consider exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis. That's but this is, th this is absolutely the right thing to do to go above and beyond uh, the standard. We'll hear from the public. They may not think it's enough, but um, I, I appreciate the direction that you're taking us in. Yes. I just want uh, the public to be aware that currently there's about $250,000 in the tree planting fund. And with this 150, that's $400,000. With that amount of money, we can plant quite a few trees. And if we are successful in working and partnering with the Tree Foundation, we can leverage that up. So uh, in terms of the loss of this canopy, I feel that it will be um, pretty remarkable what we can do in terms of replanting. OK, let's hear from the public, please. I have a motion and a second on the floor. No. Um, I have six speakers on this item. The first is Karen Jacks, Paul Andrews, Barbara Steinberg, and then Judas Lemaire. Karen? Karen, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, I'm a member of Trees for Sacramento, and I appreciate the relook that has, has happened tonight. And it's, it's certainly a much better solution than what we uh, originally saw. What I need to make very clear as someone who's also a, very much a climate activist and has been for a long time and stays up on the literature is that part of the major concern with the loss of trees, particularly the larger trees, is that even though you replant, it can take decades to get an equivalent tree. And the climate scientists are now telling us that we've got a, like a 12-year window to make massive turnarounds. And they're also talking about the, the huge health impacts of heat island effect. Um, so I, I think that that really needs to be borne in mind in decisions about uh, all projects for trees. The ordinance does need to be revisited. I'm glad that will happen. I think it needs to be revisited on the private side as well. The, the walnut tree appeal we've been involved with indi has indicated some problems with it on uh, the private side. Um, I think that we also need to do more looking, as Kevin talked about, for spaces for trees because the central city has lost since the early 2000s, massive numbers of trees. It is a horrid heat island place to walk in the, in, during the summer. And we won't have tourists at the convention center or any place if they can't uh, get out and, and walk. So we've, we've got to address this issue and we've got to address it as an urgency issue for preserving as many trees as we can, giving developers that same message uh, and recognizing this 12-year window that climate science so are talking about. Do you, do you support the, the, the motion that advances I, I, the staff? I think it's an improvement, and I think probably given where we are, it's the alternative that we have. I think there should have been a look earlier on at how to uh, do some design changes that could have saved more of those trees because it's we're, uh, we're in a climate emergency. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Paul Andrews, then Barbara Steinberg, then Judith Lemaire. Hi. I do appreciate the consideration that you suggested. I definitely think it is important to address the canopy, and that's one of the issues that I touch on. Um, 
One of the other issues that I think is important to consider is the CO2 sequestration that occurs with mature trees. They're about, they, they sequester about twice as much CO2 as younger trees do. So in order to equate the same amount of sequestration, you'd have to plant nearly double the trees in order to ensure that all that CO2 is still being pulled out of the air. Um, and uh, SAC Metro actually addresses the canopy issue, and I did a rough calculation, granted, before the 51 number came out, but I can roughly try and approximate the calculation again. Um, based on the tree diameters and the amount of canopy based on the diameter, we would be looking at roughly around 22,000 square feet of shade that would be removed, and it would be replaced with about 2,300 square feet of shade for a rough loss of about 20,000 20, square feet of shade, which would drastically impact the amount of shade available for people on hot summer days to be able to make it outside of the convention center and travel to surrounding areas in a comfortable way and not feel like they were just kind of locked inside the air-conditioned facility. Um, New York City recently created a street tree map of their urban forest. In that map, they calculated the value of each tree. This included stormwater interception, energy conservation, air pollutant removal and CO2 storage. Looking at the energy conservation per tree, we would be looking at around a net energy conservation cost of around $12,000 per year. And we would be losing about 10,000 of that basically by getting rid of the old trees and losing that kind of energy loss from being able to stop heat, stop having to do unnecessary heating and cooling that would be provided by the shade. I'm also worried that it's also setting the precedent that there are large, um, a large pro if the project is large enough, we can basically kind of just do away with some of the concerns about trees. And I've been noticing that more and more around just a couple trees here and there. Mr. All of Andrews, a sudden, your time up. is complete. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Barbara Steinberg, Judith, Judith LaMare, Dan Patowski. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I also want to say I appreciate your uh, consideration for amending this proposal. Um, this morning, I was reminded of a story that my father used to tell. <laughs> it was about a skinny old Jewish man who showed up at a lumberjack camp and tells the six foot six boss he's looking for a job. The boss asks him to cut down the biggest tree around. When the old man chops it down with one swing, the boss is amazed. Where did you learn your trade, he asks. I used to work in the Sinai forest, the old man says. Wait, you don't mean the Sinai desert. Sure, the old man says, now it's a desert. I remember your dad well. He's a great guy. I'm reminded that recent fires filled our valley with toxic smoke. Trees absorb carbon dioxide, <clears throat> and potentially harmful gases such as sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide fr from the air and release oxygen. One tree can furnish a day's supply of oxygen for four people. I'm reminded the trees continue, contribute to our quality of life and provide critical habitat for wildlife. Sacramento's founding fathers and mothers began planting trees to protect the population from our hot summers, which as witnessed by the past few years are only getting worse. Given what we know at this moment in terms of climate change, we cannot afford to lose one more healthy tree. The future of our own desert is looming. Thank you. Our next speaker is Judith LaMare, then Dan Patowski, then Mackworthy. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Judith LaMare. I uh, am here as also a member of Trees for Sacramento, a network. We're active in the county and the city and Folsom because of the climate change impacts, but also just quality of life and how we like to live and our feeling about our city, which is a tree city. Um, we, I agree that more needs to be done. I'm glad the council members have proactively addressed this tonight. But remember when we passed that ordinance, you passed an ordinance that we worked on for two and a half years. One of the key promises at that time was public trees would be protected. This is going to increase the protection for public trees, trees the city owns. Now we have the biggest project that the city's probably gonna build and we're losing trees. Here's an example. This is probably the part we don't wanna look at tonight because these London planes will go so that the convention center can be 
extend it out over sidewalk. I don't know why. Why? Because the design of the convention center and the tree removals weren't considered at the same time. But when we talked about the ordinance, we said we're going to put these things in order and we're always going to consider tree removals at the same time that we consider design. And that way we won't get in the position we're in tonight. We um, were assured that the process would result in this compatible consideration. Didn't happen. We need a thorough annual report on what the city's doing. Jeff Harris, thank you for letting us know about this project in the tree replacement fund. When you passed the ordinance, you said, we'll have an annual report on what trees are being removed and what trees are being replaced. We need that. We need to know what's going on. So um, thank you for tonight's action. Could you please more proactively bring information back to the public, engage yourself and us in the work of the Are Urban Forestry Department. Thank you. Speakers Dan Fatowski and then Mac Worthy. Honorable Mayor, City Council Member, City Manager, City Clerk Dan Piskowski, Teresa Sacramento, also a degreed arborist who's lived and worked in Sacramento for the past 28 years. One of the concerns here, this is at the convention center, is these trees were actually mitigation for when the convention center was built back in the late 90s. It wasn't a street, there was a whole bunch of redwood trees, and so that's the concern is we planted these trees and now, you know, almost 20 years later, we're starting to get some canopy back and now they're being cut down. And that's one of the reasons they were planted so close together. Normally, London Plains, you want to plant them 40 foot on center. They planted them like between 15 and 25 just to make up for what was cut down. So, and we understand trees need to be removed for the project, but when they're like on the corners and on the perimeters, now these are three English elms as far as replacing the leaf surface area, because that's what we're looking at nowadays. It's at least 250 trees for each one of these. So there's 750 trees we need just to mitigate those. On the community center theater, what we're wondering is, you have these two nice cork oaks, a 32 inch diameter and a 27. They're, only, they're right at the back of sidewalk. Like when they're originally designing, it's like, why can't, they should have looked at the trees and said, you know what, we need to save these. These are evergreen too, so we're getting 12 months out of the year carbon sequestration from these. And here's another picture of them um, right here. You can see they're really close to the back of sidewalk. So I would think, you know, if they could do some sort of design and it's in a planner, it's only like 15 foot wide. Another site here, these are on the L Street side. This is Community Center Theater. And these are two nice evergreen pears. You can see the person right there. I mean, they're fairly good size. They're shading that bus stop. YOLO bus goes there, RT, all the different services are picking up all the people there. So like next summer, they're gonna be bacon. And we, we need to like re-examine some of these trees that are on the perimeter and save them. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Our next speaker is Mac Worthy. And Mr. Worthy is the final speaker on this item. Uh, mainly the love of trees. Now you got trees, you got scrubbery, scrubbery, and you have bushes. Now some of that scrubbery that you're going to tear out of there, so people, like you said, they're doing stuff in the neighborhood, why didn't you tell them to come and get them and put them in their uh, yard? It's that simple. When the finance building was uh, refurbished over there, hundreds of thousands of dollars were put in doors, bought out of there, because they told the people. You know, I, I, I just don't see how you going to put that kind of money in that and then you have an issue of trees. Do you know that 90% of you here won't live to see trees this size? To bad no shade? 90%? If people come to church, they gonna have to go inside for the next 20 years. You gotta bear this in mind. Furthermore, you gotta have to get some revenue from somewhere else in the city in order to build that thing over there. These trees should have been solved by the architect. You're going to put $10 million into designing. You should have had him to pay for all the trees to be planted and take care. Now, we had some trees that right on the side of the street died because they weren't taken care properly. Now, I picked up a green thumb in South Carolina, azaleas and roses. And you ain't seen some things yet that I have seen. When the lightning strike a tree, that tree won't even burn the fireplace. When the lightning strike the ground, you can't grow no more cotton there. 
Where are your fires in the mountains? Lightning strike. You talk about heating people. Uh, don't worry about the earth heating. All the smoke. All of a sudden, God let it rain. Can anybody in here let it rain? Trust, people. Trust. I was telling my kids, we, when we grew up, we have seen that much smoke in the house. When the wind blowing down the chimney, you had to cook on the fireplace. Go about your business and quit worrying about God's work. He will take care of his work. The trees will grow, but you got to take care of those trees. Believe me, take care of those trees Thank in, you, Mr. Worthy. in order for you to have what you expect to have. Thank you, Mr. Worthy. I have no more speakers, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, Councilmember Ashby. Thank you, Mayor. Kevin. Can you pull up the map on your slide that has all the trees on it and it had like red for the ones that were definitely needed to go and whatever those <clears throat> your color coding was. So I have been here long enough to have worked on the, the tree ordinance and uh, also every iteration of this convention center theater package that has come forward for the last eight years. And I can't speak for the rest of the council, but I can tell you that I specifically told the architects when they came to meet with me that we should not lose any of the trees on L Street. So the ones that were pointed out covering the, that cover the uh, bus stop, I, I know I specifically asked that the design keep those in place. Can you? Yeah, so she's, yes, okay. No, I, I, I got it, I got it. I, I just needed a minute to refresh my memory and yeah, remember it. Yourself. So a lot of the trees that are up on, um, the, to the left of the, uh, the bus stop, those are on sort of a raised uh, hill. And when they're, they have to do some extreme grading there. Those trees are just aren't gonna survive the, uh, the, the two that are in absolutely. the front by the bus station? Yeah, I was getting to those. I just okay, wanted to, I, I like to cover the easy ones first. Okay. Um, so the ones to the left of the bus stop, extreme regrading. The ones to the right of the bus stop, and, that, and that's a fair question. I spoke with the, land, the architects on several occasions on that, and we had um, a lot of robust discussion on those because those are actually two that um, we could work it into the design to, to save them. Um, but. It was my thought on that, and by looking at the site and looking at it several times and, and looking at different designs that were available, that if we were, that, that those trees are not going to be a long term viable tree, that being the, the pears, they're, they're, um, they're the pear species that they are, they're not a very long lived tree and they usually develop poor structure, and so we need to work around them. They're also spaced a little bit off. So it was my thought that um, it, we would sacrifice these, these existing trees, but the end product would be better. We would, could get larger planter spaces. We can get trees that are going to grow larger, um, shade the street a little bit more, and they're going to be long-term um, assets to the community instead of coming back in 10 years and, and replacing them. If that is something that you would like changed in the design, I'm sure it can happen, but I, I would like to explain those were the reasons why I, I worked with the architects to, to make that decision oh. or make that recommendation. I personally would like to ask before I answer that portion of your question, are there, I think those two should be saved. Uh, it, and I think it's possible that they can be saved, and I think they should be, given how many we're giving up. And if somewhere down the line something happens where they need to be replaced, then we could replace them then, but we're losing so many now, which leads to the second half of my question. Those are the two that I identified looking at this map. My question for you is, are there others on here that could potentially be saved even if it were for now? I <clears throat> noted in my mind some of the ones in the... Oh, I guess what we're calling it a courtyard now. It seemed to me that there were some shade trees that might be savable that are f along the perimeter. I understand the overhang and, <clears throat> and how that's eliminating some of the really great trees, but they're right. The, the advocates are, the tree advocates are right. It's our own fault. We didn't move the tree saving process up far enough in that discussion. And part of that has to do with this discussion has been a really long, long ongoing discussion with lots of iterations and things added on. But, but we own that and there are components to this design that now are too cost prohibitive to go back. And, I, and I'm not suggesting we do any of that. However, around the perimeter of this project, 
where are there others that we could potentially hold on to given the number that we're already losing? And I understand numbers, but, you know, um, I happen to live in an area that doesn't have enough mature trees. So a tree is not a tree. A tree down here, I would trade you 20 of my trees for one tree downtown. I don't have a single one that large. It takes a lifetime to get them. And I just want to see us do what we can to protect any of the 51 that you have slated to go here. And the only thing that comes immediately to mind is, is, is what you mentioned, the, the, the row of uh, London Plains where the, the building overhangs um, that area. Um, and that would, of course, require a redesign of the, of the building. I don't think we um, can do that at that, this point because I of understand, the I understand, okay. th but those are the these only ones. two by the bus stop could potent, I don't, is it, there it would require a redesign of, of where the bus is and, and some spacing. It could happen. I don't personally think it's the, it's the best choice, uh, but it is certainly at the discretion of the council. I just want to say that we'd have to go back and evaluate and look at the proposed improvements because there is a loading dock in this area here, um, and that's why these trees are coming out. This facade here is coming out all the way out to here. I thought the loading dock entered off of the 14th Street side. This is the 14th Street side. Yeah. Right, I'm talking about Elstree. You're talking about these yeah. trees here. I don't uh, think yeah, they're impacted by see. the loading. We'll have to look and see how that configuration is on the off-site improvements. Okay. I guess my ask is, first of all, thank you to my colleagues, Councilmember Harrison Hansen, for jumping right on this after break and coming up with a better solution that I think helps a lot. Uh, if you're ever looking for a place to plant trees, by the way, I have a lot of spaces, come see me. I'd be more, more than happy to take every mitigation tree you've, you've got. Um, but I think the issue here, and I know the mayor's very sensitive to it, he just kicked off his mayor's committee this week, but either we're a city that is trying really hard to address climate action or we're not. And I wanna be, I wanna be part of the solution. And so I think, you know, mitigation and doubling up on it and what Councilmember Harris and Hansen are proposing is a really good part of that solution. But I also think painstakingly going through every one of these and seeing if there's even one or two that we can keep is worth it. And I, I understand, Kevin, I think you're one of the most valuable employees in the entire city because I've seen your work. I think you're fantastic. I love the Parks Division. I, my brag on Facebook this week is about how beautiful the trees look out in Natomas right now, thanks to parks. But I just, I, I recognize you wanna do something better than what is there right now, but I'm not sure that new in any way can beat what is at least two of these trees that we can save on balance with replacing the others to the extent that we've talked about also. Does that make sense? It, it absolutely does, and I, I just want to make a, a, a small point on that. Uh, when I'm looking at this, I'm not looking at new versus old, better now than what we have. I'm trying to look at things on at least a 30-year time frame. I'm trying to look at what is going to be sustainable long term, and, and there are many things that are nice now that aren't sustainable, and there are things that maybe don't look quite so nice you know, in the if, present but are sustainable. But I think that it's absolutely appropriate to have discussions about that. It's absolutely appropriate to say uh, that one person's vision of sustainable future is, is maybe different but equal to someone else's vision of a sustainable but future. So I that's why we have these discussions. Based on your good work here with mitigation, it may be more palatable to lose these two 15 years from now when you have 15 years of growth on the new trees as opposed to now it's like a mass loss. So my, my ask, Mayor, would be uh, to add to the motion of the two esteemed members who worked on this um, that these two particular trees on L Street be saved if possible. If the design precludes it, then so be it. Um, as Fran has indicated, there might be. At least look into it. Yep. If, okay. if, if the loading dock is the reason, then I guess forget it. But these are the two I, in looking at the map, identified that I thought were the most likely to be saved. And if I'm wrong and there's another on there that maybe could be saved, that we ask our staff to please do that. Okay. I mean, I think that's intent and I think that's appropriate. I think uh, my request is these two in particular. I think that's, okay. Vice Mayor would like to address it. Absolutely. 
Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. In my comments, I did talk about our staff working with some of the advocates to see if there are issues like that. I, I just don't want to be prescriptive. I This is my district. It's also fairly close to my neighborhood. I know it very well. And I actually, frankly, disagree with Dan Paskowski about the value of those two trees because nobody, if you're walking down L Street, will walk on that side of the street in the summer because they provide almost no protection. You walk on the Capitol Park side where there's tons of protection. Uh, the quality of them, they're not very large. They don't have a big canopy. Um, and the south-facing nature of that um, north side of L Street is just brutal in the summer. And so I, I frankly think there's probably not a good case to keep them. This is a little bit of a back to the future moment of what we did with R Street. And I know that there are a lot of people upset, but that tree canopy planting that we did there will grow into something much better than what was there. And I think as much as we want to save um, what's there, it may not actually be the best. Those fan palms provide very little, if any, shade at all. And removing those is probably important to climate change and everything else, much more than saving those trees. So I wouldn't add to my motion that we save those, but I would ask that as we work through this, that um, our staff connect with the advocates and see what options there are. And if, if there's a need to, if they, we can keep them, it doesn't change much and we can replace them later when they do come to their natural end, I think that's okay. But I just see those, when I look at the elms or the, um, other beautiful trees, the Zelkovas on my street, they, they do not compare, they do not compare to any of those majestic trees. And this is a hodgepodge of, of stuff that I think will end up much better off in the end. So uh, I, I, I don't accept that direction for the purposes of this. I feel very strongly about uh, this for my district. And, um, but I do think we've come to what is a, probably a solution that allows if, if staff deem that to be acceptable for that to happen. Okay, just to, if I just might, might, might summarize, because I, I get to you know listen and try to make sure, well, this should be a 9-0 vote here, I hope it is, that, that you're not precluding looking at the couple trees Councilmember Ashby has asked for. You're just essentially broadening it, say take a broader look, and where we can look at redesign in any way to save trees, of course, go do it and do it with, and do it with purpose. I think that's, that's the way I integrate the comments here, I think it's fine. I, I think that's okay. I just won't, I would not direct staff to leave those because I don't believe that they're the best specimens. There are well, that's not what better. I ask staff to do. I ask staff to particularly focus on those two and if they didn't mess up the design of the building then to keep them. Yeah, and I don't accept that as a change. Okay, yeah. I understand. Um, so <clears throat> just to be clear, I know it's no longer my district. I did represent that area at one time. I feel I know it fairly well too. And on occasion, my family and my district come downtown to things like the Sacramento Community Center Theater. So this is the type of decision that affects us all in every single district. And I appreciate uh, your stewardship of downtown, but I think it's important to save the trees so I won't be supporting the motion, Mayor. We do have a motion um, on the floor as amended with, with, with right direction and intent to staff save trees man save as many as you can and replace more than what is required and respectfully even more than you recommended um that's the motion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed no. okay that's an eight to one that is a that is an eight to one vote excuse me that's a seven to one yeah. Mr. oh eric's gone of course um that's a seven to one vote. That, that measure passes. Thank you all very much. Okay. Um, thank, you for the, thank you to the public, too, for, for being um, you know, vigilant and, um, and caring as much as you do. I just said thank you for caring as much as you do. Okay. Okay, that's the consent calendar. <laughs> Um, let's go uh, to item uh, 14. Uh, could 14 and 15 be taken together, Madam Clerk? Okay, let's take 14 and 15 together. Mr. Simpson. Good evening, Mayor City Council. I'm Carl Simpson, your Code and Housing Enforcement Chief. 
the items before you are the neighborhood code compliance and housing and dangerous building case fees and penalties for special assessment liens and or personal obligation. Item 14, the housing and dangerous building case fee staff report lists an amended total of 74 properties with a total of 113 $829,058 of unpaid fees scheduled for liens against the property. Three properties listed in Exhibit A of the staff report have set up payment plans and or have been paid in full and are identified as item numbers 37, 70, and 102. Item 15, <clears throat> the Community Development Department, Administrative Penalties and, and Code Compliance Case Fee Staff Report lists an amended total of 75 properties with a sum of $154,858.80 of unpaid fees and penalties scheduled for liens and or personal obligations against the property. Three properties listed in Exhibit A of the staff report have been removed from the report and are identified as line numbers 24, 38, 104, and 103. Staff recommends that the City Council adopt the two resolutions separately as amended to allow the City to collect <clears throat> the unpaid fees by placing special assessment levies and or personal obligations on the properties. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Does that conclude your staff report? It does. All right, great. Um, we have no one signed to speak on these items. Councilmember Harris. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Carl, as, as always, we thank you and your staff for your excellent work. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, I'd like to open and close the public hearing on number 14. Second. Open and close the public hearing on number 15 and take second. separate votes on each. All right, we have a motion and a second on both items. Uh, I don't see anyone signed up to speak on item number 14. Please say aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. On item 15, uh, uh, ayes. Aye. No, abstain, motions carry unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Uh, Next item is um, our preservation item. Item number 16, Madam Clerk. Item number 16 is ordinance listing 3330 McKinley Boulevard um, and Arts Center 2801 Franklin Boulevard, 729th Street and 4701 Freeport Boulevard as individual landmarks on the Sacramento Register of Historic and Cultural Resources. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor Hanson, members of the City Council. My name is Sean DeCourcy. I'm Associate Preservation Planner with the Community Development Department. Uh, these four landmark nominations before the City Council are the result of a citywide historic context and survey of mid-century modern historic resources. These resources represent some of the city's best examples of historic landmarks from the mid-century period. First, the Ivagard Shepherd Garden and Arts Center in McKinley Park meets the criteria for listing on the Sacramento Register for its association with important post-World War II development patterns in recreation, entertainment, as an, and as an important example of mid-century modern architecture. Next, Gunther's Ice Cream, one of Sacramento's most beloved institutions, meets the criteria for listing on the Sacramento Register for the building's representation of historic architecture and commerce in Sacramento. Then the Sacramento County Courthouse meets the criteria for listing on the Sacramento Register as an important and early example of the brutalist style of mid-century modern architecture while also exhibiting a number of new formalist elements. And finally, the Chase Bank, originally known as a Senator Savings and Loan, meets the criteria for listing on the Sacramento Register as an important example of the new formalist architectural style in Sacramento and for its representation of the expanding population, growing economy, and suburban development patterns after World War II. This comes to you with a recommendation from the Preservation Commission uh, to pass a motion, uh, passing an ordinance, listing these four properties as individual landmarks on the Sacramento Register of Historic and Cultural Resources. Does that conclude your report? That concludes my presentation. Great. We have one member of the public signed up to speak, uh, the wonderful Gretchen Steinberg. No relation, I believe. Um, and Ms. Steinberg, just before you start, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done personally in Mid-Century Mod to fund the study that led to this and to work collaboratively with our staff. It's really a demonstration of the leadership that can come from the community, so thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening, council members. SACMOD is proud to support the nomination of four exemplary mid-century modern landmarks, a bank, a courthouse, a community garden and art center, 
and an ice cream shop. These unique Sacramento properties share a common thread. They have been a part of our collective experience for generations and are worthy of being preserved for future generations to enjoy. This project is the result of nine years of SACMOD's research and represents hundreds of hours of dedicated work. Most importantly, though, it is the product of a collaboration among the City of Sacramento's Community Development Department, SACMOD, architectural historians from GEI Consultants, Inc., and Mead and Hunt, volunteers from our community and beyond, and the California State Office of Historic Preservation. We are so thankful for everyone's contribution and look forward to the next opportunity to work together. Thank you for listing these four remarkable mid-century modern places to the Sacramento Register of Historic and Cultural Resources. Thank you for your hard work, really, your hard work. I appreciate it. All right, we, that's the public test. We do have members um, that want to speak on the item. Let me turn it over first to Council Member Schneer. Thank you, Mayor. I know we have uh, items in three different districts. Gretchen, I just want to say thank you. It's, it's wonderful because a lot of times these types of issues come before us when there's a problem or somebody wants to take something down and to be proactive about it, get out in front and say these are, this is part of the history of Sacramento that we want to uh, preserve is a great thing to do. Gunther's Ice Cream is the one in my district. It's obviously a, a landmark for many, many reasons and many people. Um, I love talking to people who went there 75 years ago. Uh, I believe they're in year 76 or 77 now that they've been there. So with that, um, I want to close the public hearing and, and move the item. All right, there's been moved to second. Councilman Harris. Thank you, Mayor. I agree with Jay that these are pretty remarkable examples of mid-century modern. And I understand the impetus to, to uh, get them listed as such. <coughs> Mr. DeCourcy, I have a, a comment for you. Uh, and this regards the, uh, the Shepherd Garden and Arts Center. So the, the Shepherd Garden and Arts Center is currently maintained by a private group. They have a memorandum of understanding with YPSI, our Parks Department. And I would say this, that when they learned that this was intended to become an historic structure, they were quite alarmed in terms of what it would mean to their upkeep and their maintenance of the building, whether or not they could alter it in any way. I would say that if you intend to, moving forward, you know, list anything as historic, give it that designation, that you do a little bit more community outreach. I think that their fears could have been allayed with some information. I think it's very important, you know, these are lay people who have taken it on themselves to maintain this landmark and have done so for many years. It's uh, basically, you know, uh, an all-volunteer organization that runs and maintains that building. And they are always working on a shoestring. They raise money privately to work on the building. Uh, you know, when it needs a new roof, they sweat it, try to work with the city, try to come up with funding. So uh, I think I've made my point that certainly if we have volunteers, you know, who are maintaining a building, we at least afford them the right to uh, be educated in terms of what this designation might mean to their operations moving forward. Thank you, Councilmember Harris. We'll do a better job with outreach in the future. Thank you. Appreciate it. Vice Mayor. Um, you know, mid-century architecture um, has a place in my heart. I don't know if everybody else always agrees with it because we've heard um, horror stories about what people think. But I believe that, and, and I have to acknowledge Gretchen was one of those people who I think um, very passionately made a case about the community center theater and the existing convention center as a piece of this mid-century architecture. But the fact that we're here today on these four properties shows that we can still collaborate through a lot of this. And the larger study that looked at the 20 properties, I believe, really yielded some very important um, data that had never been collected before. But I want to say the two public buildings here, whether it's the McKinley Village uh, or the McKinley Park one or the courthouse, which is something that I've come to love living in that neighborhood, they are very unique and they represent a unique part of our heritage in a place and time that can't be recreated. And so uh, I, I'm very glad that we're doing this tonight. I think there will be many more mid-century buildings eventually added to our register of historic places. And again, SACMOD deserves a lot of um, gratitude from the public for what you've done. And Carson and Sean, thank you. Um, I actually do think there was 
quite a lot of outreach. Um, it's more difficult probably with a city building um, like the garden center, but I think your point is taken and um, this is a great step forward. Okay, we have um, a motion, a second. We've heard the public testimony. We've heard from the members. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. That passes nine to nothing. That's a good piece of work. Congratulations, everybody. That's just, that is great. Um, we now move to which item here? Item. I think I can make quick work of this one on item 17. Item are, 17. Are there any speakers? There are no speakers on item 17, but a lengthy staff presentation. <laughs> okay. Well, Arwen is very good. So uh, I would like to open the public hearing and then close the public hearing and move staff's recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Please say aye. Opposed? Abstain? That passes nine to nothing. Thanks, Arwen. Eight nothing. I did it again. You know, I just, I, I miss Eric Guerra. Okay, that's item 17. Let's now move to item 18. This is the Orchard Lane North and West El Camino Avenue issue. Mayor, um, like the last item, I would like to waive the staff presentation. Sorry for having you hang out uh, and open and close the public hearing and approve the item. Thank you for undoubtedly the good work that went into this, okay? Moved and seconded, no public testimony. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye opposed, abstain. That passes eight to nothing. Not going to do that again. Item 19. <laughs> Mr. Devlin. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> members of the council, Joe Devlin with your Office of Cannabis Policy and Enforcement. Um, tonight before you with um, um, certainly a, a, what I would think is a slightly more simple item compared to those that we have grappled with in the past. <clears throat> Micro businesses are the last remaining state available permit that we have yet to adopt. In short, a micro business is a, is, is a cannabis company that does a minimum of three of the four licensed activities, cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, and some sort of, of, of retail. <coughs> the, 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 the cap, if you will, or the, the, the limitation within the micro businesses is on the, can, is on the size of the canopy. It's limited to 10,000 square feet. And so if the business does does, does cultivation, uh, all of their cultivation has to occur within that 10,000 square foot, foot canopy. If, um, if they have that retail component, the currently the only retail portion that would be available to micro businesses would be that delivery only non storefront delivery uh, retail component. Otherwise, it would have to be one of our existing storefront dispensaries for them to convert into a, a, a micro business with a storefront um, a component. This does allow an amount of vertical integration for, for businesses. Right now in the city, we do have a number of folks that are applying for multiple permits. Um, at least three of those, they're applying for um, the, the cultivation, manufacturing, or retail component with us, and then they're applying for that micro business permit with the state. So adopting this does allow an amount of, of vertical integration. Conditional use permit is still a requirement as well as the, the business operating permit. <clears throat> 
The recommendation before you is to adopt this ordinance. The, the fees for this item are, are set to go to the Budget and Audit Committee later uh, in, in the month of December. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. <coughs> <laughs> All right, we do have, thank you, we do have two members of the public who want to testify. I have two members, Jared Brannon and Mac Worthy, to speak on this item. <coughs> Mr. Brannon. <coughs> Greetings, I'll keep this rather brief. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for taking this good step in creating a more accessible, equal opportunity environment for the cannabis industry. It is, my opinion a little bit overdue but you guys have your own steps to take and processes and i absolutely respect and understand that uh however i hope you keep in mind of those that uh, didn't have this before and were trying and going through all these other steps that if this was available then they may have been a successful business may have been able to actually survive the industry and the trials and tribulations I understand it hasn't been perfect or easy. It's been very rocky and rough for you guys. But for getting, or even worse, I feel, to look over these people who are no more than pioneers in a new industry would be, at the very least, a disservice, if not an injustice. So if there could be some measure of looking into reassessing the cases that have come forth of maybe not reparations now, but helping them be able to acquit themselves in the industry in some manner, I feel that would at least uh, be helpful for the community and the industry itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our last speaker on this item is Mac Worthy. People, we way, way off target. Now, people come in and something that you said, Mr. Steinberg, you said we will give people of color an opportunity, but I'm here to let you know. You don't give nobody a color opportunity. You are here to administrate taxpayers' money. Now that's slavery. Give you an opportunity, that's slavery talk. Stay out of my way, I'll obtain what I want. But you don't have Mike Worthy type of people at the table. When you come up with the $30,000 out in non-refundable, black folks should have been all over you. I tell them right now, if you shop, you would file an injunction with the state to shut it down until you make them show how some people that's all, already online making their money. By the time you come out with your profits, you're going to be sad. You can't survive. Too much, ta too much tax, too much policy on your dollar. And you're giving a man of color opportunity, you trying to raise funds for this bankrupt the city. You can't do it off uh, drugs and entertainment. It will never survive off drugs and entertainment. Face it, people. You don't have the population. You don't have the population. You don't have the people that with the money to patronize what you are doing in entertainment. Face it. You are double using nonprofit money. And down the line, I'll show you where you're using it by organizations giving babies free passes. That money already had been provided out in, and these are the things that I want to ask our rest to make a law that one time money go in, it can't be moved, and we want to track it when it's used twice. Council Member Chenier. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Joe, can you go just go back to the benefits slide? I think that's the important one. I'm going to be brief here. Um, this is, as we've gone forward on this over, I don't know how long we've been doing this now, a couple of years, uh, I think we've continued to get smarter, and this is something to take advantage of what the state has done. Um, I think this is a win-win, and I was just talking to the city manager. It's easier uh, and more efficient on the side of the city to do it this way, and it's better for the industry as well. So um, I'm happy to answer questions. I know Joe is as well, but I want to move the item. Second. Moved and seconded. Councilmember Ashby. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understand the function of this, because 
at first it was attached to other things and then we separated it to make it clear. So I just want to make sure I'm not conflating still. Um, so a, a business would be eligible to apply for this micro, I'm asking, be eligible to apply for this if they already are in the business in a couple of ways and they're just vertically integrating, adding some other component to it? Or could they be not at all and they're coming in to do all three new and so they could apply or whatever number new, three or more, and could apply for this permit? Both. So we have s some folks that have been in this, that have been operating for some amount of time. They're already doing cultivation. They've maybe branched out into manufacturing and they're doing their own distribution. Right now they have three applications in with us um, while they have one application in with the state. Um, and if we adopt this, someone new could come in and, and potentially start a, a new micro business with, with one single application as, as well. Okay. But nothing about designating them as a micro business changes the zoning requirements or the call up impact of the council, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. So even if they came in, if they changed their, they had three different uh, pending um, proposals with us, permit requests, and they consolidated that to one, they would still be held accountable across the board to the regulations of each of the three of the originals. A absolutely. All the land use restrictions and call provisions re remain in Remain in place. It just helps with the permitting cost, streamlining, and, and uh, coordinating with the state. Yes, precisely. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Councilman Warren. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I like the, uh, I like the ordinance. I think it's, it helps to make the industry uh, more efficient and all of that. But I also see that it continues to give advantages to people who are already in business and it continually leaves out people that we talked about helping people of color those that have been e even people uh, not of color but who have been left out because of the impacts of drugs and particularly marijuana in these neighborhoods that are lower income neighborhoods and so I'm going to support the motion uh, but I really I really hope this council will really understand what we're doing by continuing to advance these initiatives while leaving out a substantial portion of this city is not reflective of our city you know it's not even reflective of this council and so i really believe that uh, uh, we should expedite the inclusion of all of sacramento in this new opportunity thank you thank thank you um thank you for bringing forward this item again i know this was continuation of a work consolidated item you brought forward separately and I appreciate it because I think it deserved the attention here. Um, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, please no shouting out from the audience here. Okay. Opposed? Abstain. That passes on a vote of eight to nothing. Yes, of course. What's that? Oh no, so Steve, I'm sorry, that's seven to nothing. I'm at, I'm at, <laughs> no. So, Mr. You're, Mayor, I would. You're staying. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I would like to read into the record that Councilmember Harris had stepped away from the dais on items 17 and 18, but was in the room and would like to vote yes on both items. Okay, without objection, that's fine. <laughs> that's excellent. That, make, this is, that makes it seven to one. Okay, whatever. Makes it. Makes it Whatever it is. It okay. Passed. It passed. Let's go to the final item uh, of the evening, and that is item 20. Salkin, welcome. Good evening, Mayor Steinberg, members of the City Council. I'm Emily Halkin, your Homeless Services Coordinator. As a quick reminder, um, I was in front of you on October the 16th to ask for and did receive your approval for an investment plan for the new state funds that we call HEAP, the Homeless Emergency Aid Program, which will bring about $19 million to our community, $5.6 million directly to the city. Um, then on November 8th, um, you guys considered and adopted a shelter declaration, which in part will help us to access those HEAP funds. And while the HEAP funds do provide some significant funding for us to enhance shelter and services for people experiencing homelessness, the council has also asked for resources to help expand mitigation for communities um, impacted throughout our city by unsheltered homelessness. 
Um, HEAP, as part of the HEAP funding, we will be looking to add two new downtown street teams in the Central City and in the River District. Um, but the HEAP funds ex um, explicitly cannot be used to pay for city services, such as police or fire or public works. So um, city staff from police, fire, public works, and the parks department have developed some options for your consideration tonight, which are shown here on this table and also on page two of your staff report, that will enhance existing mitigation programs that are either already operational or that are planned under the HEAP program. Um, as you can see, the proposal includes additional staffing and equipment to have a dedicated solid waste crew to do multiple things throughout the city, including supporting the police impact team, supporting our park maintenance crews throughout the city, and supporting the soon-to-be-established two downtown street teams to collect and dispose of waste associated with various um, abandoned encampments and, and the like. There's also additional capacity recommended specific to parks and public works in the form of some equipment upgrades and expansion of an existing contract with the Conservation Corps. The total request in this budget year that we're asking for tonight is just under $400,000 to be funded from available general fund administrative contingency. Um, however, I do want to note that in the upcoming fiscal year, council would need to consider continuation of some of these costs as some of them are staffing and services that, need, that would need to extend beyond this fiscal year. Um, and then finally, in addition to the recommendations in front of you tonight, the Sacramento Fire Department has been working alongside us and, and also on their own, and will be bringing some rec recommendations forward in early 2019 for some alternative transport capacity for non-emergency calls through their pilot mobile integrated health program. So this concludes my comments for tonight. Jerome Council from Public Works and myself are available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Emily, appreciate it. Do we have public testimony on this? I have four speakers signed up on this item. Oh. The first is Mac Worthy, then Fago, then Dan Ad Adderholt, and Robert Copeland. Worthy, this is um, this is your fourth time tonight. So well, I think I have a right to a fourth time. Yeah, a fourth time. You do. Okay. That's what I'm so saying. I'm I'm just remind you of that. letting you know to uh, get when it we, all out. We look there. at the uh, homeless money here. When we look at this situation here, do you have surveillance cameras in those places? Let me ask you a question. Do you have surveillance cameras there? No. Okay. Well, we have to do it another way. Okay. We would like to have an audit on when that person check in, how long is that person in that homeless site? Is that person checks in every day? If they come back when the sun go down, we got to check that people because somebody's stealing. Because there's many people on the street. These people are not going back to where they laid their head the night before. So this is something that you should take a look at. Now, when you said we are helping these people get apartment, how many of these people got enough income for a low income <coughs> apartment? Think about it. You're still in Anline. That's double jeopardy. That's double jeopardy when you're still in Anline public funds on people that can't even help themselves. A disgrace in your scum of the earth to do that. You ain't trying to help these people. Here, the state gonna send you some more money. When uh, Trump cut the money, then where you going? You gonna put them out? And I'm gonna recommend, Mr. Trump, cut the money. Cut the money. You pull the strings of the finance and you will bring them to their knees. Then you'll see what's here. Grants and bonds. Pull it out, grants and bonds. Soon you're going to be bankruptcy and you can't get no grants and bonds because the property that you are building a low income is so low graded in quality, who will take a loan against it other than another city? Wake up, man. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Worthy. Our next speaker is Fago, then Dave, Dan Adderholt, and Robert Copeland. I actually thought there was going to be a longer discussion on the marijuana issue, so uh, my bad. Um, I do want to say, when we look at actual mitigation, the best form of mitigation is prevention. Um, with that said, 
the way the city seems to continue going about their mitigation practices is through uh, approaches that seem to dehumanize people quite often. You move people along and then complain about the trash they leave when they are given a limited amount of time to grab all their worldly possessions and then leave everything else that they can't carry. Um, rather than possibly setting up areas where they're not gonna be moved along all the time, give them trash bags and have a place nearby where they could put it so that you don't have to go clean it up all the time. Uh, things like opening a permanent rest, uh, permanent restrooms, not these portable ones that you have to keep moving and waste a bunch of money on, but permanent structures. So they have a place to go to the restroom and then you have less cleaning up people's uh, excrements. Further, I think any money going for, into more law enforcement to address homelessness is the opposite approach. Um, instead, we should be focusing on ways that we can further move people along in a humane way, like say we had parts of the river where you have safe camping sites where you could stay for two to three weeks at a time and then move. There's a trash bag. When the ranger goes through instead of trying to push everybody off, just clicks the trash bag, throws it in his truck. He's got to patrol the area anyways. You save a little bit of money that way. And you encourage the people to keep their campsites clean. You can e easily go, if you're not keeping it clean, then we will move you faster. That way you not only are giving people the human dignity of being able to stay where they are, you're reducing the cost of mitigation by allowing them the ability to clean up themselves, reducing the amount of dehumanization by enforcement, and making it easier for service providers to stay connected to the people that are camping along the rivers in other parts of the city. Thus reducing the amount of effort it takes to actually get people housed. Thank you. Mr. Clark, our next speaker is Dan Adderholt, and final speaker is Robert Copeland. First of all, I want to address this guy really quick. I was hearing this him talk really quick. I, I'm with the hey, you can need to address the count, Mr. Adderall. You need to address the city council, please. What? You need to address the city council. Okay, well, um, basically, I give bags to the homeless, and we, and I got over 1,000 people on my cruise. I got 11 crews that are going all over American River, and we're helping out throughout um, Sacramento and the schools and stuff. We, the, the park rangers are not moving homeless around no more, bud. Um, what they're doing is they're going around and making sure people go by the rules and law, make sure they maintain a safe, clean camp, and that's good. The, the, everybody's working together now, which is, should have been done in the first place. So I want to thank you, Steinberg. I found out you're the one that did the Measure You. Is that correct? We all did. And and I'm people, saying you guys all up here did this, right? The Measure You. Sacramento did. Yes. I think that's awesome. You guys are doing this to help the homeless, and I think that's awesome. I want to applaud you guys. I think you guys did a great job doing that, seriously. Also, I want to applaud the fact that you guys are trying to help the homeless situation. You guys are doing the best you guys can. And the fact that me and my homeless crews are working together every day, cleaning up around here, bud. And we're and we, um, we try and get it to where everybody works together. We have been working with park recreations, cleaning up the parkways and stuff. And I know I'm running out of time here, but I'm just saying that we all working together is the best policy. Not get more law enforcement to go after the homeless. We don't need that. What we need is more shelters built. And I think that's great. You guys got the um, measure you going. I think that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Robert Copeland. Well, I wish this plan had something else included, like teams that go out, talk to the homeless, see what they really need, like if they want to play for SSI or get her a, a ID or something or a shelter. I don't see that in any plan that I've heard. That's whole person care, Robert. That's whole uh, person care. That's what we're doing. We got outreach I all over the place. Whole person care is that mental uh, services and uh, drug uh, treatment. It's outreach. It's a sort of outreach. But That's I don't doing. see it out there. In the impact teams, yeah. That's what we're doing. Okay, we need more, I guess. Yes, you do okay. need more. Uh, Mr. Adderholt is correct. We do need more shelters. Yes. Uh, we also need more uh, restrooms, as David Andre has been saying for a long time. Uh, more uh, trash cans where the homeless can actually put their garbage when they uh, have garbage along the downtown, midtown, riverfront district, down the river. 
We need, uh, they need help. And what we really need is housing. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> okay, uh, we do have a couple members of the council who want to speak, Councilman Harris. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to address a couple of points. First, we just opened four restrooms in the River District. Uh, and uh, to, to serve the homeless population in an area where they definitely need it. You know, we are moving forward on all of the initiatives that you've all been asking for over the years. Uh, you know, we have plans, they all cost money, they all take time to implement, but we, we, we are moving forward. Um, we're also doing daytime triage in the River District as well, which we have not done previously, and this is in, with, in collaboration with the county, which is a tremendous achievement, to tell you the truth. That has not been easy to achieve. So we're making progress. I would like to move the staff recommendation. Mr. Mayor, I'd also like to make one last comment. I want to thank uh, Chief Loesch and Nico and Chad working on the EMS delivery and, and tailoring uh, what we dispatch to the needs of the people is a tremendous program. And I, I laud you highly for being creative enough to think about it and to work towards implementing it because what that will do is free up more money for us to put to other urgent needs in the city like triage. And working together, I think we're gonna create a, a great program. So thank you all. Councilman, Councilman Carr. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Emily, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, one, how many people are on the street team? So the, downtown, the two downtown street teams that will be standing up through HEAP, um, one in the River District and one in downtown, will at any point in time have 10 to 15 members on the crew, but they will rotate throughout. The goal is to, to not keep people on the team, but to help engage them and then move them on to services. But 10 to 15 at a time times two. Are they only going to be operating downtown? Um, there will be one team in the downtown core and the one in the River District at this point. And what about the other areas that have homeless populations? We could certainly explore adding more. The funding for HEAP, um, only, we only have sufficient funding through HEAP for those two teams, but certainly open to talking about you know, additional funding to, to add them elsewhere. They're, I think they would be interested. Excuse me, sir. You can't shout out from the audience. Okay. It's okay. Well, we've got a, we have a number of homeless people in District 8. And I don't see any resources being devoted to mitigating the impacts or to helping those folks at all. So uh, I would like to see if we're going to clean up one place, we should clean up everywhere in the city, not just downtown in the River District. So the, just to note, and I think we can have this conversation, the street team is the only part of this that is limited to a geography because they are on foot. The rest of these mitigations, so the expanded public works crews, the expanded parks crews, um, would be available citywide. But no street teams. Are we working with the PBIDs to maybe uh, subsidize them so they can clean up their streets? <laughs> We've had some conversations, you know, some of the PBIDs, as you know, have their own clean teams, and we certainly do coordinate with them. Not all of them have those resources, so I think that um, that would be a, a, a nice logical step to see if we could either integrate the types of activities that street teams do within their existing resources or, or have them be a partner in, in a funding program like that. Well, I assume we have the street teams in the River District because it's very visible along there. There's been a lot of emphasis on it. Everybody comes downtown. There's been emphasis on that. But these other districts are suffering as well. And uh, we can or cannot increase the number of street teams. With the existing HEAP funds, we cannot. However, um, because it's a limited pot of money and it's been, um, it, it's, it's, it's been approved um, in its current form. So we'd either have to revisit the HEAP funding proposal that the county and the city approved. But um, certainly if there's other available city funds, um, it's not a lack of capacity on the street team, it's a lack of available funding. And priorities. So we put the priorities on these two areas to the uh, detriment of the other areas of the city. And um, with the, we know the mayor's been working very diligently on getting additional shelters as well as perhaps scattered shelters throughout the city. 
what resources are we going to have available to mitigate the impacts of those? Can I answer that question? Yes. Councilman Carr? Yes, sir. Uh, I actually don't want to answer it tonight, uh, but I do want to say to you, and I know you may get tired of me saying stay tuned, but stay tuned because <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, I, I relate and actually express your frustration uh, every single day. We have a magnificent group of people working on these sets of issues led by Emily. But here's the truth of the matter, if we really want to admit a couple things. On the positive side, we have proven concept here. And I know you kind of went the other way a couple of weeks ago on these sets of issues in terms of wondering about this overall approach. But I'm going to tell you something. We have the correct approach here. It is whole person care. It is that assertive. It is that outreach. It is working with the healthcare systems. It is this low barrier triage. It is more innovative solutions around permanent housing. We have a long way to go there. It is our, our actually better collaboration with the county around mental health services and, and data sharing. We know what to do. The problem and the opportunity here, the opportunity that we have is to take what we have shown to work to get hundreds of people off the streets and actually expand it to capacity. And that's what our friends in the audience here, you know, give us a bad time every week, really have been asking for. And when I say stay tuned, I really mean it. Because it's not just a triage shelter strategy. That is part of it. It is also a funding strategy. And yes, we do have resources like we've actually never had before. And I'm going to say nothing else at this point, because I, I, we're working very hard with the city management and the city team, and I am consulting with you without violating, you know, any Brown Act laws or anything like that to get your input on, on, on various siting options, et cetera. But I'm telling you very, very soon we're going to come forward with a larger funding strategy and a larger siting strategy because I refused. I refused to continue to preside over, over modest success. I just refuse it. It's, we're better than that and we know what to do, and now we have money. And by the way, we have new state partners that we, that we haven't had before and a greater state commitment. So your question is going to be answered. And by the way, this tonight's action is very, very significant because it demonstrates, and some of the advocates may not love this part of it, you know, as they're skeptical of this part, but it is not an all or nothing approach here. It's not just help the people on the streets, but ignore the impact of homelessness. There are times where enforcement is in fact appropriate and certainly cleanup and addressing the impact of homelessness on the neighborhoods, on the business is absolutely essential. Putting forward $400,000 tonight and, I, and, and it's worth every darn penny of it to try to help the entire city but especially these geographic areas. Well, guess what? We need to do the same thing in your district. We need to do the same thing throughout the entire city. And so we've spent a year and a half, you know, doing really good things. We've brought a lot of money to the table. We've raised these programs. We've proven concept. We've helped hundreds. And now it's time to turn it into thousands. So stay tuned. Because this mayor, and I know what the support of this council, is not going to just say, wow, didn't we do well? by piloting a bunch of great concepts here. It's not nearly enough. So give me at least a couple more weeks, and then um, we'll, we'll have more discussion, OK? <clears throat> I support the motion, by the way. I'm, I'm willing to. <laughs> I'm willing to wait a couple of weeks. Yeah. My question on this particular item is 400000 it was directed at two specific areas, and I was just wondering where my area is. Your area is going to be covered by the public works portion. It's not the street teams. But if you're asking for a street team approach in South Sacramento, let me say on the record right now, I support that, and let's, let's get the funding to absolutely do that. Okay? Thank you. This gentleman supports what I just said. <laughs> he approves. Okay. <laughs> Jeff? 
So, Larry, I'd like to address your comments to a certain extent. The streets team is not primarily a trash removal service. Actually, it's more of a triage service. It's a matter of taking homeless people and giving them a job and a stipend. And yes, they pick up trash, but the street team is not going to clean up your district. Public Works is going to clean up your district. And the, the money that we're allocating for these mitigations through YPSI and, 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 uh, and Public Works, they're going to do the heavy lifting in removing most of the trash. The street teams are great because it helps us move people towards the services they need, and we get trash removal as well as kind of a bonus. But they are not our primary way of addressing mitigating trash left by homeless on the streets. I just wanted to make that clear. The mayor got this all exactly right. We owe it to our constituents to keep our streets clean, to deal with the impacts of homelessness, as we invest in moving people into housing and invest in the people who have been living outdoors, we also have to invest in keeping our streets clean. And this, this is a really good mitigation effort to move forward. I, I appreciate that clarification, but my comment still stands. Uh, we have people who need to be touched as well. We have people who are camping out, who are in the uh, creeks, who are in the uh, open areas, that uh, seemingly are forgotten. We have them camping out all the time. I had almost 200 people right across from Providence Place with all kinds of stuff. No one reached out to them. No one talked to them. No one uh, tried to uh, get them services. And they had all kinds of junk with them. One guy had 15 bicycles on a boat in his, in his uh, possessions. So uh, I'm just saying, if we're going to do it in one part of the city and we don't want to chase people around from one part of the city to another, we got to have a holistic approach with everything. Okay, this subject um, always arouses a lot, of, uh, a lot of passion. And I can just say that if there's any question about whether or not this is a major city priority and a priority of our colleagues here, I think it gets answered every time these sets of issues uh, come before the city council in the right way. And so thank you again. I appreciate the manager and the staff coming forward with, I think, a very intelligent proposal that addresses, you know, a, 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 a piece of this. So all in favor? Oh, we need a motion first. Motion by... Jeff Harris made the motion, and Jay Chenier seconded the motion. And so uh, let's say all in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, abstain. Thank you all very much. Thank you. What's that? Larry, Larry Carr is abstaining from the motion, so that is a six to nothing uh, vote with one abstention because he wants to, he, he, he uh, is waiting to see what the next step is. Fair enough. Fair enough, Councilmember Carr. Right on. Okay. That's the agenda Yay. for this evening. <laughs> Yay, this is. Uh, council ideas and questions. Did I, I need to clear the deal, then you guys got to re-pop up or something. Or, okay, I'm sorry. Larry, go ahead. Okay, big deal tomorrow. Kaiser Permanente will be offering free flu vaccinations tomorrow, Wednesday, the 28th, from 3 to 7 p.m. at the Sam and Bonnie Pinnell Community Center. Meet Sacramento Kings basketball player Buddy Hill, along with Samson and the Kings dancers for autographs. Buddy will be there between 4 and 5 p.m. and uh, sign autographs for the first 100 guests. Additionally, there will be resources on fall prevention, cancer prevention, mental health, and more. The event is open to Kaiser Permanente members and non-members. But the official flyer that you can get at at El Car, I'm probably didn't say that right. With the official flyer that you can get by contacting my office, 808-7165, you will also get a free ride on SAC uh, Smart 
RT. SAC, Smart RT, you'll be able to call them. They'll come to your house, pick you up, take you to the community center, bring you back home. So there's no reason not to get your flu shot. Uh, meet Buddy Hill and have a good time out with the Kings Dancers and Slampson. That event is Wednesday, November the 28th, 3 to 7, at the Sam and Bonnie Pinnell Community Center. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, Mr. Jennings. So I hope the public takes advantage of meeting uh, an incredible King player who is as hot as hot can be in Buddy Bucket Hill. Yeah. Right? So that's a good event, and I uh, hope they take advantage of that. For all children age 5 through 15, uh, we're going to have the second annual Kennedy Cougar Holiday Soccer Skills Clinic and Fundraiser. It's going to take place on Friday, November the 30th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. There's a $25 cost, but all the proceeds from the clinic will benefit the Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services, Outside the Walls Toy Drive, and the JF Ken Kennedy Soccer Program. And it's a bonus, register kids who bring a new unwrapped toy to the uh, event. Those toys, they will receive a free long t-shirt and those toys will go to outside the walls for their toy drive. So once again, uh, this, this Friday, November the 30th from 6 to 7.30 at JFK Stadium, the second annual JFK Kennedy Holiday Soccer Skills Clinic and Fundraiser. And then next, uh, we have from now through December the 15th, 14th, the Mills on Wheels by ACC are gathering new lap blankets, scarves, socks, gloves, and other new warm, cozy items for homebound seniors who might not otherwise receive a simple holiday gift to let them know that they are cared for and that they are not forgotten. Items can be dropped off at 7375 Park City Drive. That's the address of ACC and they can be dropped off between the hours of 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And for more information, you can contact my office or you can call area code 916-444-9533. Council Member Chenier. Thank you. Uh, just two quick events. Uh, we have our Friday night peace walk. This week we're starting at Shiloh Baptist Church, Friday night, 5 p.m. And then very appropriate for tonight, we'll be doing a tree planting at Temple Park in Oak Park, and that's on Saturday morning uh, at 8.45 a.m. Council Member Harris. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, three announcements from Natomas. These are all really fun things. On Thursday, December 6th, is our next uh, Behind the Badge meeting at Natomas High School. So this is a program to get young women of high school age together with our police department to uh, bring out the opportunities for young women uh, for careers in law enforcement. It's become a pretty popular program. We've had um, great enrollments so far and uh, several of these gals are probably going to end up in the academy. Next Saturday, December 8th from 10 to 2, there will be a robotics workshop for high school age kids uh, grade 9th through 12th at the South Natomas Library. This is a really fun event. It's a chance for the kids to get some STEM education and hands-on with robotics. Really cool thing. There's still uh, opportunities to get in the program and families interested can sign up by calling the library directly at 916-566-2123. And lastly, and I hope my two Natomas colleagues can join me, for the annual holiday tree lighting at the South Natomas Community Center, it'll be December 8th, Saturday, Starts at 5.30, goes to 7 p.m. There'll be refreshments and entertainment, and of course, the tree lighting. Councilwoman Ashby. Thank you. Uh, so, first of all, Councilmember Carr, when's your free flu clinic? Because anyone who was anywhere near Councilmember Hansen should go to that tomorrow, or whenever that was. At Kaiser, you said, right? All right. I wanted to strongly encourage Councilmember Harris, but he said he already got his flu shot, so we're good there. But anyone else in this general region should probably go get that free flu shot from Councilmember Carr's district. 
I also wanted to thank Patrick and Bob and Mulvaney because on Monday night they hosted their annual Change for Change event, which is the kickoff of the Red Kettles for Salvation Army. And uh, they always start off by raising several thousand dollars, which goes to help all the families that are served by Salvation Army in the greater Sacramento area. So thank you to the Mulvaney's for all that they do there. Councilmember Harris, I will join you next week for the Natomas Holiday Tree Lighting, which is always quite fun. And then I just wanted to let folks know that our we're ramping up in District 1 for our annual Santa and Natomas uh, events, which span over four nights. They'll start in a couple of weeks. That's Santa on the fire truck throughout the neighborhood. So folks that are interested just need to go to the website and uh, figure out what date we come closest to their house or follow Santa and Natomas on Twitter or Facebook because that uh, mania will start in just a couple of weeks. That's it for me. Um, now we move on to public comments for matters not on the agenda. I have 14 speakers signed up to speak. The first is um, Pat Sayer-Handley, Robert Copeland, and Christopher Lamb. Hi, I came tonight, uh, Mayor and uh, City Council members, uh, to report uh, on what's been happening at the North Sacramento Hagenwood Library. We have some exciting news, uh, first of all, we won the prize for the most increased uh, membership. So we um, are very proud of that because we had, right, <laughs> we hardly had any members, so this is exciting. The second thing that we're very proud of is that our t very first Taste of North Sacramento was a huge success. Uh, we had it at the launch pad and we did raise $6,000 and we truly want to thank the city of San Sacramento and Alan Warren, thank you very much for your support uh, with the tables and tents and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we had wonderful community support from the businesses. Um, this money will be used to increase the quality of our programs for teens, preschoolers, and families. We even have a job coach. Uh, another success was the election day drop-off. I heard from other uh, chapters that they also were very successful. A lot of people had not even been in our library, and this was an opportunity for them to uh, have a cup of coffee with us and talk about our great programs. Next new good news was that the, we received the Whitney Pinkerton uh, grant, which will be new books for children. What happens, they'll come to our uh, chapter first, and then they will be in the general distribution soon after that. And we want to thank uh, Councilwoman Ashby for your contribution also. We're looking forward to getting some really great new books. Uh, the last thing, we're uh, continuing to work on a permanent library. Uh, we currently are enamored with the Ms. Lynn Sayer building. Hanley, your two minutes is complete. Will you make your final comment? Oops. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Our next speaker is Robert Copeland, Christopher Lamb, then Elizabeth McDaniel. Uh, Robert Copeland is coming down. Yep. Okay, I wish Mayor Stanberg and the rest of the city council was here. But the best way to uh, prevent homelessness is housing, housing, housing. And that's a, a building of affordable housing, and that's going to take years. So uh, I think she should get on the ball, or at least increase the people that are working the planning commission or whatever, they, who plans to know these permits, uh, process the permits faster for affordable housing. That would be the best way to prevent homelessness. And that also uh, lower the uh, rent costs because more housing with that would help out the tenants, which would increase businesses in Sacramento because they'll be uh, have more money to spend on their uh, going to the movies, the restaurants, which would create jobs, which would help out measure you, I would believe, and would help out uh, the RT because more people be going to the event on the buses. And by the time I come back here next week, I'll be at the state capitol and at the county board of supervisors and a few other meetings. 
I think you, you should get on the ball and uh, prevent homelessness. That would be the best way to help out the homeless population. I don't want to see one person get off the street and two more come on, become homeless. That ain't the right way to do it. I'd rather really see uh, two people uh, come off the street and nobody go on, uh, become homeless. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Our next speaker is Christopher Lamb, then Elizabeth McDaniel, then Mac Worthy. Okay, well, hello. How are we doing today? Everybody's doing fine. I appreciate you guys taking your time and effort out to um, for this such a cynical situation that's going on, which is homelessness. Um, my thing is I believe that uh, dealing with the homelessness obviously is a very difficult thing that you have to deal with. Everybody's thinking of solutions and plans and this and that. And realistically, what happens from my experience being homeless is there's a trafficking of homeless people. There's not programs and could you please stop snapping your fingers behind me while I speak? But there is a, for me, there's like a division and a dividing of the people. There's like almost a hatred uh, that they're creating towards homelessness from the housers, people of houses and things like this. And it's only through, I believe, educating the people and that can be productive and taking them away from this homeless type environment and making them educated, training them, things like that is really what's going to make a big difference. It's a big time threat that's really going on and it's un-American and unpatriotic for Americans not taking care of Americans. I find it appalling to be sitting here going after people speaking of the movement of trees versus the movement of people and the trafficking because it's exactly what's taking place. Not to mention the fact that all you're creating are many hyper ghettos, which were just like back in the 80s, the hyper ghettos were fueled by crack cocaine. The many hyper ghettos, and you all know it, are fueled by methamphetamines, which is all over loaves and fishes, which is all over all this other place. You guys have no idea what takes place, especially to women. And if my wife was here who stands 6'6", six, six, she would tell you of many of times when she's been, been, been forced into um, sexual perversion situations down at the river and things at this. No, thank you for your people. comments. Your two minutes thank is you. complete. You guys, thank you. And thank you for having me up here. I do appreciate it. Beth McDaniel is our next speaker, then Mac Worthy, then David Andre. Um, good evening. I'm here this evening to bring to your attention and the television audience and the citizens of Sacramento up to date as to what happened to me regarding the Jane Doe uh, proof of service uh, documentation that was falsified in court documents that I had received uh, and I shared with the council. On September 6, 2018, in the city of Sacramento, an order was given to the Point Latomas apartment run by Reliant Property Management to destroy all of my personal effects. Note, I was never allowed to re-enter my apartment after illegally being thrown out on August 14, 2018. Their actions were egregious, considering the fact we had a court date uh, for September 17th of, the, of this year. That's right, 11 days prior to uh, me being given due process. The management was fully aware of the court date and deliberately and willfully destroyed all of my property and violated the law. One of the most astonishing scenarios about this assault was that it was confirmed and reported to me that the sheriff's helicopter flew over the property as this egregious assault was transpiring. I blame some of you, most of you, uh, for your silence regarding uh, the proof of service for the Jane Doe, uh, District 5, if you have ties with Reliant Property Management, District 3, because it was your district and you said silently, and specifically you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for your dismissive attitude and telling me that the information regarding the systematic network and assault to make folks homeless brought before this council was strange. The only thing strange and is a joke and it is, is in order to be housed after being unhoused, illegally thrown out, displaced illegally in a city is to be able to prove that you can sleep on the street for four days or four nights or, um, or in your car. Other than that, you're not considered as homeless, even though it was done in an illegal, Ms. egregious McDaniel, manner. Ms. McDaniel, your time is complete. Our next speaker May is Matt Worthy. May I just please say one more thing? No, ma'am, your time is complete. Our next speaker the is Matt Worthy. The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, and all they that dwell 
important. Our next speaker is Mac Worthy, then following oh, no, Mr. Worthy Mac, is David no, Andre. Mac, Mac Worthy has spoken oh, four those times. That wait upon the Lord, they shall. Ms. McDaniel, please take a seat. Please. Thank you. Mr. Worthy, yes, and then God David bless. Andre, then Jared Brannon. I don't know why the mayor worried about me speaking. <laughs> Just you keep know, your mouth closed and <clears throat> cannabis. Now, this is one plantation with eight sections. Why do we have why do we have three of them don't have cannabis in it? Now, when we take a look at when people came to America as immigrants, what did they go into business at? Black folks' neighborhood. Critical. Still going on. Now, when we look at uh, the businesses, when they come, they didn't go into white businesses, did they? Now, Carl was around the same age I am. He knew what went on in Renault, Virginia. He knew what went on there. He got out by going to the military. I got out by dropping out of college, coming here to the permanent military. But we got to understand, uh, Carl, you got to change because you got some ties to Italians, some my people. Business. You need to bring the business thing to South Sacramento because I know when, when Florence Center first went down there, my janitorial business went down with my cover camera. So these are the things you got to go back to. All this nonprofit stuff ain't going to work. The same thing, this cannabis thing, you're going to see black folks go to jail. Because I'm going to be right there with the federal government. I'm going to be right there with the federal government. And I'm going to support the federal government. But anyway, Wednesday, come on over and look at what's going on on Sanctuary Cities against uh, Scott Jones. I'll be there. I support Scott Jones. We find out the previous chief here was rambling. Are you going to let somebody come in your office and ramble on your paper? No. Scott was elected by the people. What this will be is looking for evidence when the federal government come here about sanctuary cities. That's all that'll be. Be a part of this Constitution of America. That's all you got to be. So show up over there. You'll hear from me. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Andre, then Jared Brannon, then Wilson Nino. Hey, good evening again, uh, members of council. Uh, some people are texting me some questions. If you're going to use the heap money to finance the business districts in this town, you're not allowed to spend it on city services, but if you, it seems to be the consensus is that if you're spending this on the downtown street teams and you guys are all members of the business districts, that's basically a private security force that you're, um, you're grooming there. And since that's money that's directly supposed to be sheltering people like me, I'm kind of calling this, well, why is this being sent to the business districts? I, I don't understand that. Thank you. Next speaker is Jared Brannon, Wilson Nino, then T. Gagan. Hello, council members. I'm aware of several people who have done their tax assessments at the end of the year, and uh, their numbers end up uh, the same for the marijuana industry. It ends up being over 20% in taxes, and that is that is over all of, like any agricultural tax, alcohol, tobacco, or pharmaceuticals. Does not make sense to me that this would be happening in a virgining, blossoming industry that is a fledgling and not capable of standing on its own legs. I'd also like to ask, why is cannabis being more scrutinized than the true American epidemic, the pharmaceutical division? More people have been recorded to have had died from opioids, amphetamines, painkillers, and list of others goes on. So I ask, what are you afraid of? We are the capital of California, and we can't do better. We are weak in production, uh, production variety, just production of manufacturing, and a number of other things due to the harsh scrutiny of the industry and the operators uh, that are trying to exist within it. This only serves to strengthen the, the black market, which puts us back to square one. There has to be another way, and I'm certain there are many people in the community that would love to have open, honest conversations and try and give some sort of advice or something. And I'd be more than happy to try and do outreach and things like that as well. But uh, I just, as a citizen, this is a concern of mine because I would like to see this industry thrive. I would like to see it succeed. And when it seems like it's just a reset of prohibition on alcohol 
And the, uh, even after the prohibition of alcohol was done, the taxation and everything left the industry to where we are only now just getting to where it's back to square, that was square one. Thank you, Mr. Brannon. Our Thank next you. speaker is Wilson Nino, then T. Gagan, then James Fago Clark. Wilson? Wilson? My name is Wilson McKellar Nino. Pleasure to be back in Sacramento on the committee of the Democrats. We have for you guys, I know there's normally, usually when you watch these things, there's two things you say. One on behalf of the American people, God bless you all. Two on behalf of the Democrat Party. Jerry Brown, Kevin Feinstein, um, Max Studio. I am looking to be on the city of Sacramento as a job represent and also, and how I would do this is a way of raising money on a nonprofit way as myself. One, disabled. Two, as I've done in Portland, Oregon, I've sung, bring back the community is not just downtown, midtown, Oak Park. I mean, California, regional, regional. There's been fires down towards LA. There's things that I remember growing up here and seeing so beautiful. Back when I was younger, they had things they called peer project, things for kids, kept kids out of trouble. As me standing up in front of you guys and also running for president of the United States of America versus Trump, who I trumped out. I stand here in front of not just you guys, but as I say, one nation under God, as these flags all stand, and also not behind from just myself, Ted Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, um, uh, Dr. Martha Luther King, my great cousin, also of a, my first president I vote for, Bill Clinton, also his wife, and Obama, until 14, represents Democrat Party, Renee Aguilera, the caucus. I was part of that. Okay, man. Now, Wilson, thank you so much for your you. comments. Your time is complete. Thank you. Um, anything else you want? Our next I'm speaker here. is T. Gagan, then James Fago Clark, then Edward Francis. Hello, I'm returning from last week and I'm taking, continuing with the issue of no housing and in the context, of course, of the continuing conditions of storms and winter like and winter weather. And uh, I was referred last week to one and only one um, facility that I could use as a shelter for overnight, and it turned out that it was full. In any event, it, 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 is, it was or is a carceral, that is a holding facility. It's, it has a punitive aspect uh, with restrictions. You know, you have to take off your clothes and give up all your property, um, and et cetera. And uh, it's, it's a supposedly, um, a, quasi-medical facility for addicts. That's not what I requested, and uh, that's not, it's not tenable. And I really don't like being in a population of people who are sick, um, you know, like, you know, physiological, pathological uh, hyphen problems. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it's, you're kind of rolling the dice. I mean, if it's, you know, you can make, I make my own personal decision as to if I can survive the night, but I, I wouldn't want to be in that facility long term. And uh, I don't think it would, it just wouldn't, I, I wouldn't care to. And, but that, you know, that it, there is a, a restrictive aspect to it. And I suppose if you don't comply, you might not be welcome. Um, and uh, and I, I don't think that's the only facility. And I'm going to re repeat myself, reiterate. Uh, that I, I would like to maybe get a list of more than, you know, any number of facilities that might be available on any... Mr. Gagan, thank you for your comments. Your two minutes is complete. Yeah, so... Our next speaker is James Fago Clark. Is, did you have a response of any Edward kind? Edward Francis. This is my second week. Will I come back the third week? Can we, can we have somebody meet with the gentleman, please, to... to uh... 
see if we can help him directly. We'll try to help you here, sir. If you just wait a minute. Next speaker is James Fago Clark, Edward Francis, Greg Glalvenovich, and then Dennis Hewlett. So I'm going to start off by saying I'm glad that we did extend the railroad drive. Um, it's cold outside. I haven't seen anything about any uh, warming centers or get out of the rain centers or any centers to help people get out of that week of smoke. Uh, it was kind of nice to give out the, ga the face masks that keep you safe for about an hour at a time. Um, that was an hour of people not breathing that in if they were able to make it to a fire department. But there was no place for them to go. Where, where were the people out on the streets supposed to go to get out of the smoke? Those masks that, that were being given out, they're only good for one hour. After that, it's actually worse to be wearing the mask than to be breathing the smoke because then all the particulates that have absorbed into it are just coming straight into your mouth and into your lungs. Which makes me ask, is Sacramento capable of handling a crisis situation like that? If something like that were to happen in Sacramento, would Sacramento be able to handle it? And when I asked that on my Facebook page, over 90% of the people responding said no, not a chance. We can't even ha handle the basic thing of sheltering people that we already have on the streets. Giving them a place to go when there's a public health sa safety issue going on with poor air quality to the point where it's above toxic to breathe. And we've got thousands of people out on the streets every day sleeping for this entire week in that with no place to go. If they're lucky, they can make it to a fire department and get a mask. Granted, the mask is at least better than what the county was doing that wasn't even doing that. But let's be real. The mask only helps for an hour. That's not a solution. That is not at all a solution. That's people literally going to be sick in their near future because the city did next to nothing to address the public health safety concern of our air being so toxic Thank you for that people were told Mr. to Clark. be inside. Your time is complete. Do better. Our next speaker is Edward Francis, Greg Galvinovich, Dennis Hewlett, and then Nikki Jones. Edward Francis, I don't see Edward, uh, Greg Galvinovich. Is this Edward? Are you Edward? Oh, you are? My name is Edward Francis. I live downtown, and I have for years and years. I'm here tonight to ask the council to consider getting the bikes off the, the downtown sidewalks, just in the downtown core. You know, just consider it. You know, I mean, the, the holiday season's coming up, you know, the shopping season. It's in front of the, uh, the Golden One Center. It says no bikes. People ride bikes in front of the Gold One Center all the time. Um, I also wanted to ask the uh, the jump bikes go. I've never ridden them before. I don't have a cell phone, and I understand that's the only way you can access them. Uh, the jump bikes go about 15 miles an hour, and you have signs all over that say 10 miles an hour. Like I said, I've, I've been hit by bikes. I've been hit in the back, but I've never been hit by a jump bike. This scared the hell out of me. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Mr. Glavinovich. I don't see him. Nope, he's not uh, here. Dennis Hewlett and Nikki Jones. Is Dennis here? Yep. And then following Dennis is Nikki Jones as our final speaker. Hi there. Um, Going on nearly two years ago, right after Stephen Clark was killed, we had Chief Hahn in here and he was answering a bunch of questions. And then um, he was going to go and a few of the questions he couldn't answer, he was going to come back with a report and answer those questions. One of them was the use of the helicopter, how it was to be used, what's the policy, what's the budget, what's its success rate, what does it do? And uh, I haven't heard any of that. Um, so I, I was, that ball has been dropped. Then after that, you guys did a use of force policy and a foot pursuit policy, and you seemed pretty pleased with it. And, you know, um, I was hopeful. Uh, but just recently, um, Daryl Richards was killed, and the use of force policy or, and the foot pursuit policy were broken on many levels. They didn't use any... Um, uh, time, what is sort of time and uh, space, 
and um, de-escalation, a negotiation, crisis intervention. They didn't consider mental handicaps. Um, they went in, you saw what they did. Their first interaction with them was their idea of crisis intervention is to point a gun at him and say, get on the ground. He wasn't showing it that he had a gun. I know there was a report of it, but is that crisis intervention? Is that de-escalation? I'd say no. So what are you gonna do about it when they don't follow your policy? It's really, it's just infuriating. Thanks. For your comments, and our final speaker is Nikki Jones. Ms. Jones? Ninety days, a shelter crisis, manipulative, opportunistic policy, ignoring a crisis, decades in the making, sidestepping the responsibility to creatively respond with new tools that a shelter crisis declaration would give you, avoiding the legal implications of your very own policy that criminalize survival and centering uh, and catering to business interests whose policy in practice is shelter elsewhere. And you seem to agree. So congratulations. Shelter nowhere, people everywhere. Crisis averted, money in the bank, Emily Halkin keeps her job, people outside keep their notices to vacate. <clears throat> hmm. If they're lucky enough to get them before the move along orders come down, how long will we do this? How long will your biggest priority on this issue be PR? How long will you ignore the voices of people on the ground? I continue to invite you to invest in listening to people outside and in our systems of care. And I tell you, and they will tell you how they'd spend that money how they would alleviate this crisis and what you could do to stop making things more difficult through them through your own policies. Not to brag, but it has been quite an honor to spend thousands of hours with hundreds of people who live outside. <clears throat> and believe me, they are spilling out with dreams of a different, more humane city with ideas worth working toward together, with belief in everyday goodness, but certainly with pain more than <clears throat> their share of pain. And believe me, this pain is also worth listening long to. Learning from. You'd see that in all your unsustainable your dreams of economic minutes, revitalization. Mr. Mayor, I have no more speakers. OK, I Nikki. Nikki, we give everyone two minutes. We're glad to have you back at the council, but we're not going to continue. We are adjourned. You're off. We're done with you, Nikki. Nice to see you, Nikki.